Okay, very good uh, morning, everyone, again, and thank you for joining us. We are going to continue uh, the perfect redemption plan, and what we are going to start um, with this morning is the sanctification, sanctification. And it's a bit long, so I will squeeze it and uh, just bring the juice out of it. You can, all, you can talk about sanctification forever and ever, and we will never exhaust that, that subject. Uh, but we want to see the foundation of sanctification, why it is important in our Christian life, and explain some concepts in a way that um, you will internal, uh, internalize it and not be able to forget it. So that's what we, we want to do. So we are talking about sanctification, to be made holy, sanctification. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me share yeah so that's what we want to study here sanctification that's where we are so I told you to, to read uh, to listen to six uh, uh, the perfect redemption plan one the the Lord is my um, the Lord is my um, righteousness Jehovah Chit can know to read to listen to six seven eight and nine the four of them so because uh, sanctification was still in part uh, six so that's why I said you listen to that as well uh, so it covers a lot of ground. So we are going to do that uh, uh, today, sanctification, to be sanctified. So the very day that you and I are born again, we are set apart for a divine purpose. So to be sanctified literally means to be set apart. To be made holy literally means uh, uh, to be uh, set apart. So when I'm saying I'm sanctified or I am a holy person or I'm a saint, it's the same thing. I've been set apart for a divine purpose. So when you were born again, God already had in his mind what you wanted to be. And what does he want you to be? Well, you've been predestined. The Romans chapter 8, verse 29, you've been predestined to be conformed to the image of God, uh, to image of Christ, he's the son. And Christ is the, the visible image of the invisible God. If you've seen Christ, you've seen the Father. Now, through the sanctification process, what God the Father intends is to make all of us conformed to the image of his Son. That is truly what is in the mind of Christ. And that is a truly the role of the fivefold ministry. Sanctification or holiness is the work of the Holy Spirit. So it starts at the very moment you are born again, the very moment uh, you are born again, God sets you apart. Once upon a time, you used to be a sinner, but now you are righteous, even the righteousness of God. So uh, has been imputed unto you. So that's what God uh, uh, did. You and I, once upon a time, we were prisoners of sin. We were bound by the power of darkness, but now we've been translated into the kingdom of the son of his love. So we were once, in the world and of the world, but now through Christ Jesus, we are no longer of the world, though we are in the world. So we've been set apart. So that's truly, that's why, uh, that, that's what Jesus was telling us in John chapter uh, 17, verse 16. So that's why uh, the Levi, for instance, they were a holy tribe because they were set apart from the brethren. They were separated for the service. So the same way as well, all of us, we've been set apart for a, for a purpose, for a divine purpose, to serve the Lord now in spirit and in truth. So when Jesus was praying before his crucifixion, he was praying for his disciples. That prayer is not uh, in my John chapter 17. It's not for the world. It is only for his disciples. He says, uh, 
uh, ask the Father, sanctify them or set them apart or make them holy. Make them saints by your truth and your word is the truth. So the more you and I, we get to know the, the word of God, we dwell in the word of God, the more we uh, put on the character of Christ Jesus. Now, I want to explain to you something. Uh, and I hope um, everyone will be able to understand it. Uh, I've talked about it in that um, further down, but I did not have the illustration. So um, you, you have uh, the privilege of having the illustration today uh, that others do not have. You know, the kingdom of God should always be very simple, very simple, very simple. Now, I'm going to explain both the righteousness, the sinful nature, and uh, the sanctification and so on and so forth, once and for all. So listen very uh, carefully and watch very closely what has happened in the spirit realm so that once and for all, you will understand what took place at Calvary. So if you can all see me, that's good. If you cannot see me, then there's a problem with your camera. Now, when God created Adam and Eve, they were pure, they were righteous, they were in right standing with God. Then that's what we saw from the very beginning. Then Adam and Eve sinned. When they sinned, they uh, became naked, of course, and the wages of sin is uh, death. And from that moment, all of our righteousness is but the filthy rags, all of it. No matter how much we put efforts, it is never white, white anymore. It is but the filthy rags. Now, look at this couch. This couch is grayish, it is a gray color. It is not white. You can wash it, wash it, it remains uh, gray. So every one of us, when we were born, we were born with this sinful nature. This couch is the sinful nature. Whether you are just uh, one second uh, old, in this world, you are born with this couch in you. Now, there are three places. So like I always say, those three categories of sins, the, the sin leading to death. Here we have uh, all the sexual sins. Here we have all the um, uh, uh, idolatry. And then here we have all the heresy. So you can make that couch as long as possible and put all the sins that you want, but I've just put the three categories. So they are in us. So even the best, even the high priest, when he, uh, even Joseph, they tried us. And that's why they could not go to heaven. They were in paradise in the bosom of Abraham. They did well. They practiced righteousness, but this thing was still in them, this couch, the sinful nature, the Adamic nature, the first Adam, this full sinful nature was in them. Now, sinning, by when the Bible says, uh, John the Baptist says that, uh, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's talking about the sinful nature. God wanted to take away this sinful nature from us, which came with the fall of Adam. Now, sinning is this. You see the same couch now that is stained with uh, different colors. Now, this is like I say, the sexual immorality. You know, let's put sexual immorality in the pink and so attractive, you know. This is a sexual immorality. This is uh, uh, all idolatry. 
So it'd be the tarot card reading, necromancy, all that has to do with your idolatry, they are packaged in this. So glitters attract so many people as well. And this is uh, the, the heresy. All oh, the heresy, the false doctrine, uh, other gods uh, uh, through the teaching, other prophets that are another way to, to God, all of this. Now, to sin is whenever I sit on this uh, part of the couch. So this thing is already in me, the sinful nature is already in me. So when, uh, if I say I'm a fornicator, what happens? God clothed me with, uh, when Adam sinned, God clothed me, uh, washed the, the sins, the blood of bulls and goats. He could wash away the sins wash it away but not take it away the stain of sin could be removed from the robe of righteousness so god killed an animal cloth them with the skin of that animal or robe of righteousness but this couch was still in them and this couch with all those appetites of uh, the three categories of sins were in them and this in every unborn uh unborn non-born again person so when I say I'm sinning, is I come and I sit on this part of uh, this couch. So if I sit on this one, imagine this one has been uh, soaked in a um, in the pink dye and glittery dye. So that stain, that uh, dye is now on my cloth as well, my white robe. So my white robe is stained as well. So God, on the day of atonement, God did, uh, the first thing that God did is he washed my white robe of righteousness that was stained. And I became as white as snow, like David said. And also in the, in the new covenant, also if we sin, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all land of righteousness. He still washes our white robe of righteousness. In the book of Zechariah, um, the Jacob Zechariah saw the high priest Joshua with a, a robe that was but filthy rags, and Satan was standing by his right uh, side to oppose him and resist him. And uh, the angel of the Lord, who is Christ Jesus, commanded that uh, his filthy robes of uh, so he was the high priest, the best of them, not sinning, otherwise, he would drop dead in the holy of holies. But it was but uh, filthy rags, not white at all. So God removed the white robe, that uh, filthy rags, and clothed, clothed him with the robe of righteousness. But this was still uh, in him. So how did God dealt with this one? So every year on the Day of Atonement, atonement just means covering. So God will take a white sheet. And what he did, he covered it. So that is atonement. But the fact that I've covered it, it still means it is under. It has gone nowhere, it is still under. That nature, those appetites, those desires were still there. And since it is soaking wet, I will come again and I will sit on this one. And I'm stained again. So God, the next year, he needs to wash me again and put another sheet to cover that sinful uh, nature. So that's what happened every year. That's why they, op they offered sacrifices every single year to cover the sinful nature, to cover this, especially this couch. So that... Uh, you will not sit, but unfortunately, they will come and sit again. People like us, Joseph, they truly resisted. That nature was in them. They, had, they were born with that Adamic nature, but they truly resisted to sit on this couch of sexual immorality, to sit on this couch of idolatry. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to sit on this couch of idolatry, the golden calf. They refused. We are not sitting on it in this matter. We'd rather die. 
Now, what the blood of bulls and goats could not do is to remove this. That's why every year they were to cover it with a new sacrifice of an animal. But in the fullness of time, when Christ Jesus came, he was now the solution, the last Adam. He could now deal with the not cover it atonement, but a remission, entire removal. That's what we are talking about, entire removal. Now, when Christ Jesus came in the fullness of time, he did not sin like Adam because he was not born of uh, a man. He was the seed of the woman. So Jesus was not born with this couch in him. Yes, this is the only advantage that Jesus, the son of man, did not, uh, he had that we don't have. He was not born with this couch in him, with this sinful, Adamic sinful nature, because he was not the son of, uh, of Joseph, he was the son of uh, Mary, the seed of the woman, so that this sinful nature will not be in him. So it was easy. he was tempted to sit on this couch, but he resists. Like Paul said to us in Hebrew, we have a high priest who can sympathize with the feelings of our infirmity because you know, he was tempted in every way, just like we are yet without the sin. And we saw in the wilderness, Satan also came and tempted him with the glory of this world. If you only bow to me, I would give you all the gold, all the silver, idol worship, and you would have all the things. There were so many women around there. Don't you think that one of them wanted to marry Jesus? Of course. Women are always wanting to marry. It's natural. God created marriage. So there were so many women around there. They wanted to marry as well. And some of them even might have proposed to him some wrong things. But he refused to sit on the couch of sexual immorality. And the couch of heresy. He refused to sit on it. He did not practice uh, any of the sin leading to death. And he did not have this. So that's why when he died for us, he, his blood had more power than the blood of bulls and goats. What the blood of bulls and goats could not do, the blood of Jesus still washes uh, our robe that we've stained. And he clothes us with the robe of righteousness. Uh, praise the Lord. He forgives all of our iniquity, just like the blood of bulls and goats could do. But what the blood of bulls and God could not do that Jesus is now doing for us, now done for his blood, for every person that believes in him, is to completely take away this sinful nature. Completely. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, not the sins, the sin, the sinful nature especially. So he has washed you from staining uh, yourself with any of those sins. Done away with this one. But this one that was in you, that was, you were bent on backsliding. That's why he said in that uh, Hosea chapter 14, verse 4, that we saw on Wednesday, he will heal your backsliding. And he will love you freely because the wrath of God has been poured on Christ Jesus. That's why he could heal your backsliding. We were bent, like Jeremiah said, we were bent on backsliding, like a vine that is not growing straight, but it is already crooked. Because of this intrinsic defect that was in us, the sinful nature of Adam. And what the blood of Jesus did, it removed the sinful nature in us. That's why now when you are in Christ, Paul says to you, you are a new creation. You are not a new evolution that God is trying to clean uh, the sky so that you will become uh, brownish, uh, sorry, uh, grayish, and then put some bleach on it to make it white. Mm -mm -mm. That's not what God is doing. He completely removed it. Completely. That's why Paul said, the things that I used to do, I do them no more. He completely dealt with it. If we understand what took place at Calvary, then uh, our Christian work is going to be a work of victory. That nature is no longer in me. That's why you are a new creation, not a new evolution, a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new and all things are of God. That's why 
throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not dwell in them because the sinful nature was in them. So though outwardly they were clean, they refused to sit on this couch that is staining the right robe of righteousness. And whenever they did sit on it, they would uh, confess, they would offer an animal sacrifice every day. There was an animal sacrifice in the morning and the evening for the sin of the nation. And uh, on the day of atonement also, there was uh, an animal sacrifice. They had to cover, cover, cover on the national day of atonement to cover again, to wash uh, the white robe of righteousness that they've stained every single day they offered it. But in the fullness of the time Christ came, died for us once and for all. He will, when Paul is, is explaining the book of Hebrews, Christ is no longer coming to die again for sin. No. He has dealt with that once and for all. Truly, like Paul says, and Peter says the same thing, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, sin should no longer have dominion over you. That nature is no longer in you. You were crucified with him, buried with him. Now you are a new creation. All the things, all things are past. So behold, all things are new. And all things in you are of God. There's no more this nature. Even David, the Holy Spirit rested upon him and never departed, but the Holy Spirit was not in him because of uh, the sinful uh, nature. In the New Testament, the only reason the Holy Spirit dwells in us because this one is no longer. So if you do not understand those basic things, if the church does not understand those basic things, that's why we are called saints or holy people. God has dealt with this through the blood of Jesus. What the blood of bulls and goats could not do to take away this sinful nature, God has uh, dealt with. That's why sin has become a choice. If we sin, not when we sin. We are not expected to be sitting here all the time because that nature has been dealt with. So if now we sin, if we we happen to sit on one of the, the side of this couch. If we confess it and we forsake it, it's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, now that this couch is uh, removed completely, so what is happening is uh, God now wants us that's not our part, the main part of sanctification. Where are you? I'm looking for you. Aha, uh -huh. is to enthrone Christ Jesus, the King of righteousness. This white throne, that is now the only throne that needs to be in our heart. And many, that's what Jesus is saying. You are calling me Lord, Lord, but you are not doing what I'm telling you to do. Many Christians have been saved. Hallelujah. So meaning, you are born again. This one and this one, they've been taken away from the life. And God has washed the sins away. They are white as snow now. But Christ has not been made enthroned. The only potentate, like Paul said to Timothy, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They've not crowned Jesus in the heart, the King of Righteousness. Our Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the king of Salem, or the king of peace, and the king of the peace, the prince of righteousness. This is what is imputed unto us. But just like in the book of Judges, in those days there were no kings. Therefore, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's the problem of the church. Because though it has been imputed unto us, but we've not allowed Jesus to be enthroned, the king of righteousness in our heart. That's why we are doing what is right in our own eyes. And the purpose of sanctification is uh, that uh, the Holy One of Israel, even Christ Jesus, will come and be enthroned in your life. He will now live his life through you by the power of the Holy Ghost, that you would yield, you will abdicate 
your throne for his one. Like Jonathan removed his armor and gave it to David. David said to David, you are going to be king. Jonathan was supposed to be the next king, but he removed his armor, he removed his, uh, everything that he had, he gave it now to David and gave, David gave him his shepherd thing. He said now to David, you are going to be king and I'm going to sit next to you. So it is now allowing the son of David, Christ Jesus, to be enthroned in our heart. That is uh, the job of the church. And uh, that sanctification, like Jesus said, this is done when people, you, you are teaching the people because people are still thinking the same way. The fact that you are born again, that's what has happened in your spirit. All that has happened in the spirit. I've been taken away in the spirit realm. This one has been imputed onto you, credited onto you. Now it is your willful decision to allow Christ to see in the throne of your heart, to abdicate your own throne. That's what is yielding, surrendering to the Holy Spirit, that Christ will be living this life now for you. His life of holiness, his life of truth, his life of sanctification and being set apart from the world. That's truly the job of the church. And that is done by the washing, sanctify them by your truth. And your word is a truth. And uh, Paul said, the mind is going to be renewed by the washing of the water of the world. The fact that you are born again, you are, doesn't mean that your mind has been renewed. You need the word of God to tell that this is not who you are anymore. You are no longer the one that comes and sits on uh, the sexual immoralities. No. Grace, that used to be the, the, the prostitute, like uh, one of the sisters that she used to be a prostitute, her name was Grace. And the day she was born again, the night before, the, the day before she had one of her clients. And then after that, she went to the, the to church. She became born again. He explained to her that she, Grace, the prostitute is dead. So the next day, the client came and said that in Africa, you always send the boy, go and ask if Auntie Grace is there, say his uncle so-and-so. Then the, the little boy came, his auntie, auntie Grace, Auntie Grace, Uncle so and so is uh, looking for, for you. Go, say, go and say to that uncle that Auntie Grace died yesterday. Ah, yes, she died yesterday. You've been crucified with Christ and buried with. That's why we baptize people. We are telling you that you are buried. The old you have been buried. So that's why Paul say, reckon yourself dead to sin or concede to reckon. To consider yourself, not that you die, consider yourself dead completely to sin. And that's what she understood. It was properly taught. To her. The gospel is supposed to be so simple that you don't need to be learned to understand those things. Even little children playing with dolls can understand salvation and what truly took place in the spirit realm. And then the uncle came, said, But Grace, I'm looking for you. He said, the grace that you are looking for died yesterday at the altar. This grace, the sinner, the prostitute died yesterday. But this is grace sanctified. This is holy grace that is now living. And she is no longer a prostitute. And whatever sin that you used to be, or I used to be, Jerry the fornicator died. Jerry the gambler died. Jerry the thief died as well when I was 12. He died. When I was 11, when I received Jesus, he died. So this has happened in the spirit. Now, the role of the church is to tell you who you are because you don't know who you are now. You don't know what took place in the spirit. Now, we want uh, what took place in the spirit realm to have ascendancy, preeminence over your soulish area, so meaning all your emotions and your intellect, and also have a preeminence over your body. Living in the spirit is allowing what happened in the spirit to dominate what is happening in your soul and what is happening in your body. It is no longer your body that is dictating what is happening in your soul and happening 
in your spirit, killing your spirit basically, but letting what has happened into the spirit affect your soul and your body. And the medium or the interface that God would use to affect the spirit and to affect the body is the soul. So your intellect and your emotions. So that's why we preach the gospel. You are going to be sanctified by the kind of word that you have received. The more of the truth of the word of God you know, the more peculiar. Peculiar doesn't mean that you are strange or awkward, uh, that you are unique. You are no longer like uh, the common people out there that are living the life like uh, animals. I like the French version. The French version of the, the Bible in First Corinthians talks about the uh, lom animal, the ape man. So basically, yes, they were right. Man descended from a monkey or from the ape, but that's the one that is not born again. We were created in the image of God. Hallelujah. We did not descend from any animal. We descended from God. We created that. We are the image of the invisible God now. But then because he's holy, we are also holy. So now the greatest part is the sanctification now. Preparing the people with the word of God to be conformed. That's the purpose for which God saved us. To be set apart for, the, for a divine purpose. That is a sanctification. And our job now, the fivefold ministry, apostle, pastors, a prophet, apostle, prophet, uh, evangelist, pastors, and teachers uh, is to build up the body of Christ until they will come to the full measure of the stature of Christ Jesus, that they will grow to become just like Christ Jesus, just like a baby will grow and become adult or mature. We are perfecting the saints. That's why it's called the perfect redemption plan. We should not be afraid of it. It's the perfect, we are perfecting the same. That was the plan of Jesus in the beatitude. He keeps on saying you need to be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect because he was going to deal with this one that was our problem, the Adamic nature and practicing sin. Now that this one has been dealt with, so if you continue to practice sin, John says to you, my little children, let, let no one deceive you. He that continues to practice the sin is truly of the devil. Because the devil is sin from the beginning. If truly you are born, is a seed, born again, is a seed, remains with this one has been dealt with, that sinful nature has been dealt with, and now you have the righteous nature of King Jesus enthroned in your heart. How can you continue to practice sin? Then truly you are the devil. You are deceiving yourself. So if we've understood those, uh, those, um, that illustration about those uh, sofas. That's why there is no more sacrifice or sin. Paul says in the, book, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 from 25 to the end, if we willfully now continue to sin, there's no more sacrifice or sin, but the fearful expectation of a judgment. And in the Hebrews chapter 13, that's why he's, he's talking to the born again believers. If you continue to live in fornication, there's no, I'm pleading the blood of Jesus. Either you are not saved or you are saved. <laughs> we need, you need to define yourself, whether you're a backslider. If you're a backslider, praise the Lord, then you know who you are. But if you are truly a Christian and uh, you say that, oh, I'm still living in fornication, God says marriage should be honored by everyone. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Because fornicators and adulterers, God is going to judge them. He did not say it is under the blood of Jesus because there is no more sacrifice for sin. This one has been dealt away with. That sinful nature. So you should no longer be continuing in sin. Because the righteousness of God has been imputed unto even the righteousness of Christ. So I enthrone him king over your life. Why do you call him Lord, Lord, and you don't do what he says to you? We receive Jesus not just as a savior, we receive him as a, as a Lord. It is only when we receive him as a Lord that he's able to save us to the uttermost and perfect us. So we are going for the perfecting of the saints. That's truly what we are after. Yeah, that was the role of the apostles and Paul is crying out 
for the sanctification of the church. And he's even afraid that he start, they started well, the Galatian church said, who has bewitched you, you foolish Galatian, you started well. You started well. I want to present you a chaste virgin, not just your robe of righteousness is clean white now, I've washed it, all the sins are be back, you are no longer staining it, keep on sitting here again and again and again, staining. I'm afraid that my labor might have been in vain. I'm afraid of what I'm going to say to Jesus when I was here. I'm going to stand before him. Most of the time when I weep before the Lord, I don't weep because a person that just does not have a paper. I don't. Uh, that's not what I weep for. No. Or someone doesn't have a job. That's not what I weep for. Never, never, never. I know that just a battle, we will fight through it and um, the Lord will move that mountain. Most of the time when I weep before the Lord, this is when the people are sinning. And most of the time when the Holy Spirit is grieved, as you read it in Ephesians, this is when the people are sinning against him. It grieves the Lord, and the true man of God will be weeping like Paul, be weeping like the Jeremiah over the sins of the people, weeping like Daniel. We are weeping for the wrong things because... Uh, our ways are not the ways of God. What is dear to God is not what is dear to us. So sanctify them by your word. And your word is uh, truth. When you hear more of the word, that's why you need to spend your time in this book. Your life will be transformed. People will not know what is happening to you because you are no longer going to be conformed to the world. We are going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are going to work on it here. It's going to affect the spirit and the body. In Jesus' mind. So let us, after that illustration, uh, now let us go back to uh, yes. So God is going to sanctify us uh, by uh, his word, because his word is uh, truth. So, like I said to you, as you discover the truth of God, even your body also uh, is going to be sanctified, because Paul tells us that uh, we should no longer be conformed to this, this world or this age, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we will present our body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable worship. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And I told you we need to be conformed to the image of Christ. That is the purpose of our salvation. The reason why God saved us is so that we can receive many sons. That is like his son Jesus. That's Romans chapter 20. Uh, a very, very Roman chapter 8 verse 29 that is the purpose and if we don't understand why God saved us then we have a problem we truly have a problem now when God had his uh, priest uh, in, they were ministering before him the priest had an inscription on the forehead holiness unto the Lord that is in Exodus chapter 39 verse 30 so God wants our holiness to be seen by everyone, it was a gold plate that was uh, not our own holiness, but his holiness. Holiness has nothing to do with uh, her wearing a long skirt, uh, wearing a head scarf, that has nothing to do with holiness. Not putting on makeup, uh, no. Even uh, like uh, Catherine Kuhlman, uh, no. no, it wasn't Catherine Kuhlman, it was uh, Amy McPherson. They used to criticize her for putting on the makeup. He said, even an old barn, old barn need a coat of paint. So put on your, your, your makeup, put on your lipstick, but everything that the Christians do, they do it with uh, moderation in the mighty name of Jesus. We are forbidden to be in asceticism. Asceticism is the neglect of the body. So you will neglect your, your body. You will not uh, brush your teeth. You will not... Uh, uh, put some perfume on yourself. Even when we are fasting, Jesus said, that's not what we do. Don't disfigure yourself. Don't, uh, don't uh, go out without brushing your teeth or with dry lips, no. Even when, when you fast, take your bath, 
take your shower, anoint yourself, so put some cream on your face, put some uh, deodorant or some uh, eau de cologne or perfume, and then go out. Jesus doesn't want us to practice any asceticism, neglect of the body. Take good care of yourself in Jesus' mighty name. So dressing nicely uh, is uh, godly. So, but don't dress in a way that is uh, provocative. That's the only thing. Don't dress in a way that is going to be provocative. Uh, that's not the holiness. But it has nothing to do with the length of your skirt. Uh, you should reach up to your, your, elbow, your, your ankles. That's not what it means. So dress nicely, dress, do the hallelujah check. Like, let me show you the hallelujah check in the name of Jesus. Voila. Now, the hallelujah check for men and for women. When you go out in the name of Jesus, you need to do the hallelujah check. What is the hallelujah check? The hallelujah check, <laughs> many churches have to come up with the hallelujah check because of the 21st century. You need to bend forward. If you bend forward and your bosom is showing, then you know that you need to change what you are wearing because you are going to be a destruction for the, the men that are worshiping. They are not going to be worshiping the Lord. They are going to be distracted um, by uh, what God has graced you with. So for women, when you bend forward, do the hallelujah. If all your, 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 your chest is showing, then that's, uh, you need to learn to change what you are wearing in the mighty name of Jesus. The other hallelujah check, you lift up your, your hands, hallelujah, because that's what we are, we are, we are praising the Lord, bend low, bend low. So that's the first hallelujah check. Second hallelujah check is you lift up your hand. If when you lift up your hand, your, your belly is showing, then you know that you need to change that, uh, that thing. Or for men as well, when you, when you sit down and you bend and all your underwear are show, you know that's not holiness. Because you are a distraction to the people. So put on uh, your belt, a trouser with a belt, in the mighty name of uh, Jesus. Hallelujah, I check for everyone. As when you sit down, if uh, your, your skirt is coming out uh, above your, your knee and you now have to cover, uh, so do the hallelujah check, sit down as well, see how your your skirt is coming either above your knees. If you come above your knee, then wear some tight underneath. That's okay. Or come with a wrapper in the church where you cover uh, your, 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 your knees so that people are not distracted. So just a common sense. You are not there to distract people and uh, people are not, men also are not there to distract. Men as well with those tight jeans. Uh, that do, uh, that almost show all your, your male organs. People are not supposed to see all your male organs with your tight chin. So why do you come with uh, those kind of things uh, uh, <laughs> in church? That's not appropriate. So you are going to be just a distraction for uh, the people in the church. That's not the uh, holiness. So dress in a way that is not provocative, dress in a way that uh, will not make people uh, uncomfortable, will not distract the people either. So as long as you are doing that, praise the Lord, it is well in the mighty name. You can have your dreadlocks, who cares? You can have uh, red, red, red hair, that's not the problem. Uh, people themselves, they will uh, change. As the word of God is being taught to them, they will discover, okay, I like it, I don't like it. Don't stumble over the hairstyle of the people. But even like Paul says, uh, with moderation. Even the hairstyle in their days, they used to put even gold to show that they are rich. You put even gold in the, um, in the braids. Paul says, you need to show all your gold that the, the necklace is not enough, the rings are not enough. You need even to put uh, uh, gold in, uh, in, your, in your braids, let your adornment be with modesty. So that was uh, the, the summary of the thing. Everything that we are doing, even your adornment, let it be with uh, moderation. So put on your makeup. Any child that will forbid you to have a makeup, that's not holiness. Put on your makeup. Go to the cinemas. Go into the cinemas so that not make you unholy. But watch what you are watching. If it is something that is glorifying the devil, you know that it is not profitable to you. Having television is not of the devil. 
but with your television, watch the kind of programs that you are watching. If those programs are leading you to witchcraft, then you know that you're not supposed to go to watch it. Harry Potter and the Scooby-Doo's and all the other things, you know that it is not glorifying. Even some comedies that are now LGBT comedies and so on and so forth that are pushing the, the, the gay agenda or always talking about uh, obscene things, lewd things, you know that Christians are not supposed to watch those kind of things and be laughing on those things. If you are laughing when they're talking, they're making sexual jokes, it means that uh, you, in your heart, you still have that perversion. So the washing of the word of God, even the kind of jokes that you used to like, once sanctification starts happening with the washing of the word of God, the kind of jokes that you used to tolerate, you no longer tolerate them. Not that you become close-minded, but uh, any joke that is unholy, that is denigrating the people, that is putting down a group of people, uh, putting down women, uh, that is uh, putting down a group of people uh, based on the color, the ethnicity, and you no longer want to, to laugh at those kind of jokes because uh, your mind has been renewed. You now see how God sees everyone. So your mind will become truly the mind of Christ. So there's nothing wrong with television. Watch your television. But the kind of program that you are watching, be careful. There's nothing wrong with radio. Listen to your radio. There's nothing wrong with the internet. These are just uh, uh, media, the platforms that we can use for good or for evil. So just be careful what you are watching on it. And as your mind is renewed, there's only one way to be sanctified, which is by the word, the truth of the word of God. There's nobody can lay hands on you to be sanctified. No, it is, it happened initially when you are born again and you need to walk it out. With the word of God, the more you will listen to the word of God, you study the word of God, you discover the truth, the more your life becomes conformed to the image of Christ. And uh, it is uh, an instant of a uh, thing that happens. It is also an ongoing thing. And until we die, we are never going to reach. But we don't give up. We continue to get closer. Forces have not arrived yet. And we get a better version of us, a better version of us in the mighty name of Jesus. And then you will sit down because all the fruit of the spirit, they are just uh, the breakdown of what holiness is, what the character of Christ is. Because the fruit of the spirit are actually the character of Christ or holiness. Like uh, Paul, the same Paul says in Ephesians now, the fruit of the spirit is in all righteousness or righteousness and holiness. You can interchange those words. The one who practices righteousness is holy. The one who is holy, he practices righteousness automatically. So you can interchange those two words. So as we study the word of God, we discover who we are. We now become people of convictions and uh, our life changes. We now start to read the fruit of the spirit and we want to be like that. When uh, Rigos Wolf was born again, he had an anger problem. So he locked himself up for 10 days. God, you need to deal with this anger because I know I'm now born again. And this thing is no longer supposed to be in you. You need to deal with that once and for all. People used to wait upon the Lord to deal with uh, those things. We no longer wait upon the Lord to exchange. He would take our rubbish, he would give us uh, his uh, nature now to renew our strength. That's what they did. That's why the first, in those days when they would convert a believer, they will uh, most of the time have him fast uh, three days and three nights without food. Like uh, when Paul, they were using the uh, after chapter eight and after chapter nine, when Paul was converted from uh, Saul of Tarsus, he fasted for three days and three nights and Ananias came and ministered to him. So that's what the, the Christian of Azusa were using. So that when people are born again, they would immediately now attack the aspect of holiness so that the people will start living uh, the right way. So that drunkenness would fall off so that alcohol, uh, the, the, the drug addiction, the smoking would just fall off. 
Today, we still have Christians that are, keep on drinking, drinking, drinking. There's no sanctification. So that's why we don't cast out the demon of drunkenness. If you have something of the devil in you, how can you cast it out? We have a pastor that's even that are smoking. Pastors that are uh, watching pornography and so on and so forth. You know, at least even watching pornography sometimes, uh, that's the least crime. Some of them are just uh, cheating all the time, all the time. They, they are caught again and again and again and again. But they never dealt with sanctification. They never crucified the vessels. The, like Paul said, I die daily. So when people had the sexual appetite, that they were always uh, fornicating that daughter, they would lock themselves away for uh, three days and three nights until God would break that thing in them. So when they came out, there was no thing like sexual scandal in the ministries. We've neglected. There are some foundations in Christianity and holiness is the foundation, truly. There are five works of the Holy Spirit. The first one is that salvation. We are born again. He adopts us. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. The second work of the Holy Spirit is the sanctification. We've thrown away sanctification out of the window in the church. The third work of the Holy Spirit is the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. That's the third work of the Holy Spirit. The fourth work of the Holy Spirit is uh, the sign and wonders, the healing aspect, sign and wonders, and miracle deliverance. That's uh, the fourth uh, aspect of uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. The fifth uh, work of the Holy Spirit is uh, uh, bringing back Jesus, the second coming uh, of Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit also will do that the same way. He raised Jesus from the dead. He ascended. The same way also he's going to bring uh, the new Jerusalem. It's going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. What the church has done is that we've removed uh, the second work of the Holy Spirit. So everybody knows about it. No. We've thrown away uh, Christ, uh the Holy Spirit, the sanctification, the second work of the Holy Spirit. Now, God wants to live his life through. That's why we don't have the same sign, wonders, and miracles. We started to preach the four square gospel. Amy McPherson even lay and named the church the four square gospel. Instead of the five square gospel, the four square gospel. So the feet, what they removed was holiness. So they just preach now, Jesus saves. Jesus uh, baptized in the Holy Ghost, we are Pentecostals. Jesus uh, hears, and Jesus is the soon coming king. They threw away holiness. So they, that's what they were preaching for. They threw away holiness. That's why we just came out of the Pentecostal and charismatic movement. When they decided to throw holiness out of the window, they said, I don't want to be part of it. It's not just about sign and wonders. If we don't prepare people to meet Jesus, if they are still practicing sin, like John says, then you are deceiving yourself. He that practices sin belongs to the devil. How can you say that God dealt with your sinful nature and you are still practicing sin leading to death? And Paul said the same thing at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, verse uh, 9 to let's take it to 10. That you are deceiving yourself as well. So that's a truly what we need to go back to. And we will revisit that in another form in the Jehovah Shammah, because for the glory as well to happen, sanctification is the crucial. For a closer work with God, sanctification is crucial. Because God is a holy God. That's what is the problem. Now that he has dealt with it, he can come and dwell with us, but we are still fooling with this one. Yes, now, that's why, the, that's why uh, that Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, where the Holy Ghost is groaning in us, the, it was groanings were first mentioned in uh, Exodus chapter 6. He was groaning because of the sins 
And when most of that one, the Holy Ghost is groaning, is weeping inside us, it is because of the temple is unclean. Is unclean. The temple is unclean. And uh, the Holy Ghost is uncomfortable. That's why it's groaning. May God help us. That's why when we pray for the salvation of the people, uh, we are groaning. Because he's groaning for, the, for the, the sinners to be saved. He's weeping for the salvation. In the mighty name of Jesus. So now let's go back to our work. So I've summarized a lot of things. Uh, given it a better understanding. So that's what God wants holiness to be seen, to be evident in the life of everyone, not uh, you are holy and nobody knows it. It was on the forehead of the, the high priest, holiness uh, unto the Lord. So the Lord wants to, to purge us. He wants to purge us so that we can serve him. He wants us to have the mind of Christ. So, uh, like I said, Paul is telling us in Timothy, to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, uh, he says uh, uh, that we should be moderate in our dressing and our adornment. So that's what I've addressed, uh, moderation in our uh, dressing. So in the uh, Old Testament, like I said, the priest was supposed to be holy, set apart. But in the New Testament, all of us, have been made priests. So we, we, we received some things in the new covenant. We did not know why. And if we don't know why we received them, why we all were made priests and why we were all made kings, because God has dealt with the, with the finger of the sinful nature. Moses cried out, I wish that all of God's people were prophets. It was not possible to put the spirit upon uh, all of them. He only had to set apart some of them, the Levites, the ten percent, the Levite, they represent a, a, a tithe of a of a nation. The tithe principle, even with the humans, it is a tithe principle. So, so if, if you want to be in the fivefold ministry, Hallelujah, you are you, your life is actually a tithe. There are millions of people, but you are going to live a, a consecrated life. We cannot even talk about consecration if we don't talk about. Uh, Holiness. Consecration is for the service, but the foundation needs to be holiness. If they did not have holiness, the priest could not uh, officiate in the temple. And how did God uh, make sure that uh, the priest in the Old Testament were holy? He gave them a copy of the scroll, a copy of the Bible, the book of the law. So the, prof, the, the priest was supposed to have a copy of the uh, book. So that when they read it, they are going to be sanctified by the word. Like Jesus said, but for your truth, your word is the truth. According to John chapter 17, verse 17. The, the king also had a copy of the scroll. And uh, the, what do you call it? The prophet also had uh, the copy of the scroll. And people are supposed to come to you. Malachi chapter 2, verse 7 says, the people are supposed to come to you to seek the knowledge, so you are, your lips, the lips of the priest, you are a priest, you are a priestess. So not just the pastor now, in your family, your children are supposed to come to you now. Mom, what does God say about this? Mom, what is God saying about this? You are supposed to retain your lips, should keep the knowledge of the word of God. So, and they should seek the law at his mouth. So they would come to you, what is God saying? Because you are now a priest, a priestess, you are now a king and a queen. Because you are the messenger of God. That's what Malachi chapter 2, verse 7 says. But unfortunately, just like in the days of, uh, of, the, 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 of uh, Malachi and uh, in the Old Testament, as well, even the priest did not know the word of God. And today as well. Parents, they don't know the word of God. So how can they help the children when they have a question about life? They will give them the opinion of the teachers instead of giving them what God says. The pastors also, many of our pulpit, those that are consecrated for the service, they don't know the word of God. So when people ask them what is God saying, 
what is the counsel of the word of God? They don't know. And Hosea was saying that, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, my people perish for lack of knowledge because you, my priest, have rejected my knowledge. Therefore, I also have rejected you from being my priest. Many people are behind the pulpit. God has rejected them long time ago. They, they are just... Uh, uh, clinging, uh, they are just making noise like uh, brass and uh, all those cymbals. God is no longer there. God has rejected them because they did not keep the knowledge of God. They, they, they don't know the law of God. They, they are not truly representing God. So God also decided, since you don't have my knowledge, you are not giving my knowledge to the people, and because you rejected my knowledge, I also have rejected you from being my my uh, my uh, my priest. And the same thing also for King Saul. God also rejected him from being a king because he did not keep the knowledge of God. He refused to to obey. Then God said, "I also have rejected you from being my king." So. That is where we need to go back because we are all kings and priests. Once upon a time, we walked in darkness, but we should no longer walk in darkness. We are now a chosen, that's what Peter is saying, we are now a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That's what, so a king that the royal priesthood here is what uh, Moses was saying, we are a kingdom of a priests. That's a royal priest, a kingdom of priests. All of us are now kings and all of us are now kings. So it is not the responsibility of only one man to know the word of God. Like it was in the Old Testament and Moses cried out, oh, I wish that all of God's people could have the Holy Spirit, were prophets, so that they can prophesy. That's we saw in the gifts of the Spirit, the testimony of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of prophecy. Now he has to pour that the Spirit upon all the flesh. So we are a kingdom of priests. That's what the royal priesthood means. A holy nation now. The peculiar people. We are unique. We are not like a uh, herd that is just following. Other people. No, no, no. We are not following anyone. We are following Christ. We are peculiar. We are unique. Peculiar means unique, not strange or awkward. The pagan wants you to feel awkward and strange because you are not uh, following in the flood of dissipation but you are not the awkward. I want you to know you are peculiar, you are unique. So that we should show forth the praises of him. Once we see the life that you are living at time, it would show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. That's what Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So that is our job, to shine, to shine to shine around us, to shine in our community, to shine. This is what we want to do, to shine in our community. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, as we read the word of God, as we become doers of the word of God, our life effortlessly is going to be transformed because our mind also is being renewed. So you and I, we have the mind of Christ. So don't struggle in your life that I don't know what to do. You have received the mind of Christ. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says. You have the mind of Christ. Now, what is our problem? We need to permit or allow. Sometimes we are resisting that mind of Christ because we, we were not used to think that way. But in the spirit realm, that mind is in us now. Now, for us to allow that mind of Christ to function in us, we need to learn the word of God. We need to learn how God thinks, what this is his counsel about a different uh, situation in life. That's how the Holy Spirit will, will be able to live through us, to think through us. When Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in us. In me, and the Lord that I now live in the flesh, I now live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Not that Paul died literally, no. He allowed his mind to be renewed so that he was now thinking the way Christ was thinking and now acting the way Christ would have acted. That's what it means that Christ is now living through me. 
that we are like John the Baptist put it, I'm decreasing and Christ is increasing. Basically, uh, people are seeing less of less of me, but they are now seeing more and more of Christ. So that's why even where Christ was crucified, he was crucified on the place of the, the skull. Where he was crucified was called Golgotha, it means the place of the skull. That's uh, so that you can receive the mind of Christ. That's uh, John, John chapter 19, verse 17. So allow that mind to be in you. Don't hinder it. Allow it uh, to be in. That's what Paul is saying to us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind, permit or allow this mind be in you that was also in Christ uh, Jesus. As we study the word of God, we are going to be able to renew that mind. Christ is going to be able to sanctify us and cleanse us by the washing of the water of the word of God. That's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. It is important, the word of God. We can't have sanctification without the word of God. Unfortunately, sanctification, the way it has been taught, it is now about having a long skirt, not putting on makeup, not putting on a perfume, not putting up a jewel. Put your jewels in the name of Jesus. Put your powder, my sisters, in the name of Jesus. Put some wonderful uh, perfume. And for men, put some wonderful eau de cologne. Trim your beard in the mighty name of Jesus. Shave yourself in the mighty name of Jesus. Look good. Hallelujah. Don't look like a bomb in the street. That's not holiness. So you don't need to dress like John the Baptist with a camel hair and the belt of, uh, uh, of a leather, of, uh, made of leather. Uh, having a strange diet, peculiar, I told you, peculiar, that doesn't mean strange and weird. So you don't need to be eating locust and honey for your diet and make people uncomfortable think that you are crazy. That's not holiness. Some of the prophets, they were dramatic because they were doing, pro the life was a prophetic action. So when we did not understand it, so the skin of an animal is just to symbolize that God has imputed his righteousness. So when you were water baptized, it was for the remission of sin. So you are now imputed, just like when God killed the animal and clothed it, uh, took his, the skin of that animal and clothed Adam and Eve. That's what John the Baptist was prophetically saying. When I'm baptizing you, you are going to be clothed with this uh, new skin. It was a prophetic action. So don't, you don't need to dress like John the Baptist. You don't need to be a Nazarite, have long dreadlocks if you don't want it. If that's your style, praise the Lord. But you don't need to have dreadlocks to be like Samson. It was a, a consecration. This outward appearance of consecration it has nothing to do with uh, consecration. Consecration was the, of the heart living a holy life, and Samson broke all the things of holiness. He went and married a pagan. That was the first thing. Second, he started to, to visit a, a prostitute. Third, he started to live in drunkenness. Fourth, he started to live in a fornication with Delilah. He broke all the things about holiness and consecration, but he kept the hair. It was never about the hair, so when they cut his hair, God has already departed a long time away from him. So even now, when he, he receives strength to kill the, uh, uh, the 3,000 uh, uh, Philistines, it was first of all because he repented. His hair has not even grown to be as long as uh, they used to be. For 40 years, he did not shave his hair. So imagine how long those dreadlocks were. And here he was only in prison few uh, for so not even a year. So this hair has not grown to be dreadlocks. So it was never about the length of the hair. It was about the consecration, the holiness and the consecration to the service. So it was an outward appearance of what was the internal consecration. So like politics, like all those things, we don't need them anymore. Like the circumcision, it was an outward appear, uh, sign that God has imputed, credited righteousness. So if circumcision is for men, is not your tradition, you don't need to do that. For, for medical reasons, if you want, for uh, hygiene, if you want to do that to your son, praise the Lord. But uh, you don't have to if you don't want to, if it is not your culture. That's what Paul is. Paul even now was stoned by the Jews, beaten up because he starts to, to say to people, stop even the circumcision. You don't need it. 
if it is not your culture. It was a cultural thing, but God used it as a symbol that he has imputed righteousness. You can be circumcised and you are living like a dog. Is that your you being a righteous? No. So all those outward signs that they used to have in the Old Testament, we don't need them anymore. If you want to follow them, praise the Lord, but you don't need to force anyone else. So dress nicely, smell good, hallelujah. You see your brother Jerry dresses nicely, hallelujah, because he understood holiness has nothing to do with wearing uh, uh, rags. It is about your heart and being a moderate in everything that you do in the mighty name of uh, Jesus. So that's what we want, the true kind of uh, holiness. So the blood of Jesus is it truly speaking on our behalf. So uh, the Bible says uh, that uh, we are the elect of God. So he picked us out, uh, out of the world according to his foreknowledge. And then he did what he sanctified us. The reason why he sanctified us is so that we can obey him and sprinkle the blood of Jesus and spoke grace unto us, a peace, and the peace be multiplied. So when you are going to live in sanctification through the blood of Jesus that set you apart, the grace of God is going to be multiplied in your life. The peace of God is going to be multiplied in your life as well in the mighty name of Jesus as you continue to obey him. That's what Peter is telling us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 in his greetings. So, though we are still in the flesh, but uh, we, we are, the moment we are born again, we are always in the spirit. The moment you are born again, because your spirit is now alive, your spirit is now alive. So that's why God does not want us to continue to walk in the flesh. Walking in the flesh means uh, uh, doing the things that are contrary to the Bible. That's how simple it is. So whenever you are doing things that the Bible forbids us to do, whenever you are behaving the way God doesn't want us to behave, you are being a carnal, you are walking in the flesh. But whenever you are doing things that the Bible recommends, you are being uh, spiritual in the mighty name of uh, Jesus. So see, if anyone does not have the spirit of the Lord, is none of him. So that's Romans chapter 9, verse, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 9. So you have the spirit of the Lord, so you are always in the spirit. Now that you are always in the spirit, now walk in the spirit, meaning do the things that are in, uh, uh, in accordance with uh, the written uh, word of God. Because our Father, God is spirit, and he's seeking those that are going to worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what uh, Jesus said to that woman in John chapter 4, verse 23 to verse 24. Being in the spirit doesn't mean that you are floating in the air or you are being weird. Like when you go to some prophetic groups, they are so weird that even uh, people that are not Christian, when they come into the midst, they just uh, run away from them. You don't need to be weird when you are prophesying. Some people, the moment they start, they were speaking a normal English with you. But the moment they start to prophesy, they start to speak in King James. Thus uh, says the Lord, thou shalt not. So you, but one minute ago, you were speaking the normal English. Why do you need to speak in King James? I don't understand King James English. Speak plainly. So being in the spirit is when you are born again. You are always in the spirit. Now walk in the spirit, meaning live and do things in line with the written word of God. Because the word that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Don't be weird when you are prophesying. Don't be weird when you are sharing the word of God. It is just be do it as if you were just striking a conversation with someone. It should not be awkward. So we don't want to have a wrong understanding of being in the spirit. That's what I said. You don't need to pray in tongues to be in the spirit. You are always in the spirit. The moment you are born again, the spirit of the Lord is in you. You are always in the spirit. You are seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. That's where you are. You are always in the spirit. You never come out of the spirit unless you decide to backslide and you die spiritually. 
you are raised with him, you are seated with him at the right hand, you are always uh, in the spirit. So let us avoid having the carnal mind, but let us have the mind of Christ now. Think like Christ, act like Christ, allow this mind to be in us. First Corinthians 2, 16 and Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. We need to allow that mind. For that, we need to renew our mind, to wash it. We need to brainwash ourselves with the word of God. I, I used to pray, God, brainwash me with the word of God. I would only speak the word, think the word. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. You need to believe in your heart that you've been set apart. You've been sanctified the very moment you were born again. It is now that you are holy. And uh, you need to purpose in your heart no longer to practice it, no longer to come and sit again on this couch of uh, sin any longer. And the more you spend time in the, with the Lord, the more he renews your strength and those desires of sinning no longer happen. And God will give you advice in the book of Psalm, Psalm chapter 1, David gives us his secret. He does not sit with the scornful, he does not sit with the sinners. If you become a Christian and your circle of friends are still the same, it tells me the kind of Christian you are. If all your friends are still those that are going to nine clubs and party and you call them your friends, it tells me the kind of friends you are, the kind of Christian you are. And uh, I can already even uh, foretell what might happen because you will soon backslide because don't be deceived. If a company will corrupt good habit, you are not going to corrupt them. They are going to corrupt you. So David said, Psalm 1, that's the first thing I do. I'm not going to sit with them. I'm not going to, to be in the company, walk in the path. No, 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 no. I'm going to stay with the righteous. That's why we need to befriend the people. The moment they are born again, we need to become the friends. Otherwise, they will go back to the wicked friends. And the wicked friends will start uh, putting them down. Why are you acting so weird? Why are you this? Why don't you drink with us anymore? Why don't you smoke with us? Why don't you come clubbing with us anymore? And so on and so forth. And they feel now ashamed and bullied and peer pressure start happening and they go back into the world. But if now we befriend them, that's what Christians is the family. We befriend them, we start to call them, we start to visit them. Then they now are attached to us because we have now the same value. Show me your friends, I'm going to tell you who you are truly. And where you are going is based on the friends that you have around you. And I will know that this is this person wants to go far with the Lord because of the kind of friends he has surrounded himself with. But if I see you with the kind of friends you have, I say you don't want to go any far with the Lord. You just want to stay at Gilgal. So that if you see me go and then take again the bath to wash away your sins. You don't want to go yonder at uh, Bethel in the house of the Lord. You don't want to go yonder at Jericho. You don't want to go at the Jordan. There is always a deeper walk with Christ, a higher level of sanctification. And that is our responsibility, our own choice in the name of uh, Jesus. So you don't need to wait to be canonized. Uh, so when you die, the Catholic Church will canonize you and call you saint. You are saint the moment you are born again. Now live out that sanctification of God. Be unique. Be different from the world. Be separate from the world. Mary had children other than uh, Jesus. Jews, James and Jude, they are the brother of Jesus. He had sisters as well. So she did not remain virgin. So stop calling her Virgin Mary. That's a religion. So that they would think that if you need to be holy, you need to be a virgin. That's, that's a lie. That's a religion. You don't need to be celibate either. Peter was married. Hallelujah. Peter was married and Stephen is a shadow was healing the sick. So the doctrine of having people uh, forcing a man of God to be single like the Catholic Church does is of the devil. Like Peter said, Paul said to Timothy, in the latter days, some people would forbid even people of getting married. These are the doctrines of the devil. Because if you forbid someone that doesn't have the gift, to be uh, alone. Some people can receive that gift to be a eunuch for the Lord for a season. And that season is over. 
And now the one that says it's over, they marry. Jesus said, not everybody is called to be a eunuch for the Lord. Some people are made eunuch by men. That was in the days uh, when the, the, uh, the king would castrate some men to take care of his uh, concubine, uh, like in uh, the days of Esther, the days of Daniel, and so on and so forth. But nobody does it these days. Uh, but some people would make themselves a eunuch for the sake of the gospel, like the Paul and Barnabas. But John was married. James was married. Peter was married. They were all married apart from uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas. So that the false teaching that you need to, for you to have the anointing, you need to uh, not to be married for you to be holy. You need uh, not to be married as the doctrine of the devil. And then what happens is that those people are burning in themselves. That's why now they become a pedophile. They now become homosexual. You feel men with men in that uh, monastery that uh, don't, uh, you forbid them to, to, to have women and they have a real desire for sex, that God did not kill it. God is the one that gave us those desires. And then you see them now being homosexuals. So that at least if I'm not sleeping with women, let me sleep with men. So they will be sleeping between them, the priests. They will be living a, a life of uh, sin. Because it is an unnatural for someone that has uh, been created by God to remain like that. And those sisters as well, they will be removing pregnancies and so on and so forth. And children are going to be abused in those uh, orphanages. That's why you see all those scandals with the Catholic Church. It is of the devil to bring reproach. That's not holiness. Go marry in the name of Jesus. Paul says, if you have a desire to be married, go marry. Men and women, go marry in the mighty name of uh, Jesus. Philip the evangelist also was married. And he has daughters that were prophesying in Acts chapter uh, 21, verse 9. So we need to uproot all those wrong understandings of holiness. You are born again in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, uh, so we see, for instance, uh, uh, also, one of the practices that is happening in the church, we have a lot of uh, necromancy going on in the church where we are praying to the dead, dead saints. We don't need to pray to the dead saints. We've already addressed it in our basically of a prayer. So uh, they are not holier than you are. They were highly favored, like the angel said to Mary, but we don't pray to Mary. That's necromancy. We don't pray to uh, Elijah. He's dead. You know, Elijah was, was uh, raptured. We don't pray to Elisha. That's necromancy. We don't visit the tomb of Elijah to get some power. That's necromancy. We don't, that's why God had to bury Moses himself. Otherwise, he would be practicing necromancy. And God said to them that uh, if they practice uh, necromancy, he is going to punish them. And that's what God said to them in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 and 11. That necromancy is forbidden. And we should not practice the necromancy. God says that there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. So that is abortion. Today's abortion. They were offering the sons to Molech. So abortion is actually witchcraft. It is a killing the, the, the children. So they would take that feet and that they would burn it. It is not new. There's nothing new under the sun. That the, the abortion is worshiping the Molech. Or who uses a divination. Like I told you, Balaam is a diviner. Who observes uh, the, 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 the times. Uh, how do you call it? Astrologers. You are not a cancer or Vigo or whatever sign that they have. That's not for, for you. You are a born again son, uh, son or daughter of God. You don't observe those things, the stars or the times. You don't observe those things. You are none of that. Or an enchanter uh, or a witch or a charmer. 
or uh, a consulter of family spirit. We don't consult also family spirit. A lot of people have consulting from a wizard or a necromancer, the one that is talking to the dead. So Halloween is coming. The day of the saint is coming. Don't go and talk. Many times even on Facebook, people would have Christian are right are, are writing things that are necromancy. They'll say, oh, mother, since you passed away, I missed you. Now I have two more children. To whom are you talking? The person is no longer there, can't hear you. So that is a necromancy. The way you can put it is, okay, Father, I thank you. I remember this is the, the second year that my mom has gone to glory. I totally thank God for the life that she has lived, the impact that she has. So you are glorifying God for the life of your mother that is no longer around. Know that you are talking to your mother. When I read some posts of some uh, Christian on Facebook, they are just necromancers. And they don't know that they are inviting that spirit. Oh, mother, uh, since you died, uh, things have not been the same again. We truly miss you, mother. Uh, but I would just want to tell you that I have two more children and they are not going to school. They are going to turn well. You are a necromancer. And even sometimes pastor and pastor's wife, you see the post on the Facebook, you, see, you are just necromancers. We don't talk to the dead, including on Facebook, we don't talk to the dead. Whether they are saints or even our own parents, King Saul got killed because of that. He went and consulted the spirit of Samuel. And Samuel said, because you've done it, you are going to die. He went to consult a medium to bring out the spirit of, uh, of Saul. And God said, you, because of that, you are going to die. So no necromancy. Halloween is coming. The Catholic, the Catholic tried to do something that was nice. They wanted to defeat. Uh, uh, that's why they changed even Christmas. Jesus was not born in, uh, in December. He was born in September, the Feast of Tabernacle. But they put it on uh, December. The Orthodox uh, uh, Catholics in Russia, they put it in January. Because the uh, winter equinox is different. The Egyptian church also put it, uh, it's another day, the Christmas is on another day because the, 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 the calendar also is different. It was because they were trying to defeat the pagan culture. Okay, let's put it on this date so that uh, when the pagan want to worship the Son of God, they will now come and worship Christ Jesus. That's what truly was in their heart to stop uh, the Christian from. Uh, worshiping the equinox, the winter solstice, and then uh, the, also coming to church at the same time. You no, know, say, okay, let us now say that Jesus was born. That was a good intention. Okay, for Easter, they're also the same thing. But the good thing about the Easter, it coincides also with the Passover, April, April, end of March, beginning of April, so that, that's okay. But now with Halloween, they could not find anything that was scriptural to defeat it. Now they said, okay, on the first, let the pagans celebrate Halloween on the 31st, and let us a Christian remember the saints on the 1st of November. That was initially what, uh, when I say Catholic, Catholic means universal. It is not just the Roman Catholic, I'm talking about the Roman, not the Roman Catholic, the, the universal church, which split later on in the church of Egypt uh, and the church in uh, East Europe and the church in Rome that is now, mainly the Roman Catholic, but Catholic means the universal, uh, universal church, that's what it means. Uh, so when they had that, that in, in mind, now the saints now were bringing flowers to the loved ones on the 1st of November. But unfortunately on the 1st of November, we would bring uh, a bottle of wine, we will bring some bread as well. We will put it on that tomb and we would pour also wine around it and say, oh, my mother, you see, we've come to see you. And, and we would eat at the gravestone. They were real practicing libation, pouring uh, wine. Be careful on your traditional wedding when you are pouring wine on the floor for your ancestors. That's libation. We don't do libations. That's part of necromancy where you are giving some drink to some dead people. Is part of necromancy, the liberation that we are practicing. And they, of course, the whole 
group of Christians had to practice necromancy on the 1st of November. The moment we became Christ, Pentecostal Christian, we were born again. We stopped going to the grave of our grandmother. Every 1st of November, we used to go. Now, after that, what we did, 1st of November, we just went. But I, I, my aunties would go, or my father would go. Uh, they would just go and clean, uh, just clean the, the, the tomb, and then put some flowers, and then walk away. No prayer was made. No, no word was spoken. The person is not there. Just weed out the, the finger, and that's it. Avoid necromancy. Avoid the pressure of the family for you to practice necromancy. Tomorrow is Halloween. And the uh, no, first of November, the day of the dead, and people will be doing necromancy. We don't do necromancy. And if you know of any ministry where the pastors went to lie on the grave of Wigglesworth, of uh, uh, whatever other man of God, the John G. Lake, they are just necromancers. So one, either they were ignorant of the word of God, so God had mercy on them, but you know already the spirit that is operating in that ministry is already a crooked spirit, a foul spirit, even a spirit of divination, the spirit of the grave. Like I texted uh, Sister Lynn, I said they have a gravy spirit, so it is going to be good for a Sunday roast. So <laughs> that, that was just a joke. But uh, we don't have any gravy spirit here. We don't temper with the spirit of the grave. We are not necromancers. The day you hear Brother Jairus going to lie on someone's grave to receive any power, leave the house of prayer for all nations. We are not necromancers. So I hope this is clear for everyone. It is an abomination to the Lord, your God. And uh, he will drive you out from before you. So we shall be perfect with the Lord your God. So that's what Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 13 says. We want to be perfect. I've already told you our soul lost it when they went to consult a medium. We don't do that. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all those uh, uh, heroes of faith, we love them. They serve the Lord. We just need to imitate the thing. We don't pray to them. And some of the, the, the people, also are, they are not practicing necromancy, uh, but it, is, it sounds like a prayer of necromancy. The way they would be praying, I, I won't name the name of the, 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 that church. They will be praying, oh God, the God of uh, Bishop uh, so-and-so, answer me. Jesus himself said to you, I'm going to my father, he's also your father. Why don't you say, oh, our father? Just because people have not been a disciple. We are making, we are taking the place of Jesus in the lives of the people. We need to decrease it truly so that Christ may increase. That's what John the Baptist will say. I need to take the backstage and Christ needs to be in the forefront. Let me go in the backstage. So when you are praying, Oh, the God of Bishop Swam. So, answer my prayer. The God of John Knox. I went to a prophetic gathering uh, here. They invited me in 2013. Uh, Christian Center. I went there. Oh, the God of John Knox that brought revival. The God of Swam. He, he was just a necromancer. I stood up. I walked out. I don't have time for necromancers. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the reference that we receive. Hallelujah. We may thank God for what he did for John Knox, but we don't call the God of John. That's necromancy. And by trying to appear to people that we are learned, that we've learned about John Knox, we've learned about all the revivals. That's why we are, we are not praying to God. We are praying to the people to let the people know that I've read about John Knox. I've read about, now that we are praying for revival, let me tell you what I've read. So we are not praying to God. We are praying to impress the people about our knowledge of the revival that ever happened in the UK. And by so doing, unknowingly we've become necromancers. 
or the spirit that was in John Knox, the spirit that was, is it not the Holy Spirit? Why don't you call the Holy Spirit? Let us run away. No one is holier than thou. God does not like it. Elijah, like James tell, told, told us in James chapter 5, verse 17, Elijah was a man that had the same nature like you. He was not holier than you. No, he has the same nature like you, but he practiced righteousness. That's what we are talking about, holiness here. You don't need to envy any of them. They were not holier than you. But they practice righteousness. And the fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. So no one is holier than any of you. And God hated one without thinking that some other brethren are holier than we are. He imputed his holiness, even the holiness of Jesus to each one of us. The moment we were born again. So, According to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13, Christ has been made unto us a sanctification or holiness. He has been made that to every single born again believer. So, none of us is uh, out of touch or is holy years. So, we don't do those kind of things where the pastor has bodyguards to protect him, to try, if you touch him, you are going to disturb the anointing, all that nonsense that is going on, that pastors now have bodyguards. Even when they are preaching, people are standing left and right. Uh, if you go to a church, what well, that's what is happening, and the Lord told you to go there, and you had a plan from the Lord to go there, but the day you start seeing that in the house of prayer for all nations, please remind me of what I've written in these Bible studies, what the Lord said already in these Bible studies, according to the word of God. Now, sometimes also, you can go into a place where you Sudan, Sudan or there's a crowd and you need the, the police to control the crowd. That's another thing. But you are, there's no uh, threat uh, over your life. The, the crowd is not trying to run over you and try to throng you like they were thronging Jesus. And you need bodyguards. No, you are not holy. You don't disturb uh, the anointing. No one is holier than anyone else. Many times also in church sometimes, when they invite a guest speaker, the guest speaker does not attend the beginning. He does not attend the praise and worship. He does not attend any other thing. He only comes when he's to preach. So they will keep him in a, in a room as if he's so special that he does not need to worship the Lord. As if he's so special, he does not need to pray with the people. He's holier than all the other brethren. It ought not to be in the church. We are all brethren. No one is holier than another person. We may be used by God based on our yieldedness. We may occupy an office, but we are not better than the brethren. What you require, what I say to one, I say to all. Mark chapter 13, verse 37. What I say to one, I say to all. We are all to worship the Lord. We are all to pray. When I was even in Tanzania, they wanted to treat me like those American missionaries that they receive. They would put them in the, oh, no, you don't come now. Don't come now. The things are not yet ready. So I said, ah, okay. When I realized that that's what they were trying to do, and I hate those kind of things. But God hates it. I'm not better than anyone. The first day, the second day, when I realized it, so there was a back door. So I will say to them, can I use the toilet? Yeah, they yeah, yeah. so, okay, the toilet is there. Okay, I would, I would go to the toilet and then I'll come out and then I'll go by the, the back door of the kitchen and I'll go directly in church. So they will be there. He said, he said, he said he went to the toilet. It's taking longer. I said, oh, no, he's already in church. And they would come, they would see me in church. What we said to you to wait. I said, I'm supposed to worship my God like everybody. I'm supposed to pray with everybody here. I don't just come to preach. I'm not a star or celebrity. We've imported some pagan things in the church that make some people holier than others. No one is holier than the, any other. God loves us. He wants to hear all of our voices. He wants to hear uh, all of us pray to him, sing to him. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. If you have breath, so praise the Lord. We are not a star that will come out just to preach. The same thing as well. When they ask you to preach, 
then come on time. And if it is not your day to preach as well, respect also the people, come on time. It shows that you respect the people as well. You don't see yourself above other people unless you're out of town. But if you're in the same church, you are that the pastor at the church and it's not you that is preaching, then sit down, come on time. Don't stay at home. Don't say that, no, I, I don't have, I, I cannot listen to the sermon of the brother so and so. I am the pastor. It means that you think that you are better than that, that the brother, that God cannot use in the way he uses you. Our actions, they speak volume, what we truly believe in our heart. So Jesus could take the worship where the woman with the alabaster oil would bow to, 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 to him and anoint his feet, according to Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 39. But we are not supposed to accept any man's worship. There are some traditions of men that are almost worship. Uh, where people will come and prostrate before you, that is worship, and you should not accept it. And God hates it. So we need to be very, very careful. Uh, Paul refused the worship that they wanted to give him. When God has to do signs and wonders, people have the tendency of worshiping you. And you need to discourage it as much as possible. Because mankind is idolater at heart. That's our nature. We were created to worship. So if we are not careful, when God uses us, then people start to worship us. Only Jesus could accept that worship. No man of God can accept us as someone to come and worship him. No. In the book of Acts, chapter 10, uh, 25 to 26, we see when Peter went to Cornelius' house, Cornelius also wanted to fell at his feet to worship him. Peter said, no, stand up. I myself, I'm also a man. You are also a man. You are not holier than uh, any brother. And you are not also holier than any pagan. No, because the pagan is supposed to prostrate before me. I'm, a, I'm now a sanctified person. No. Worship only belongs to God. Even when angels appear in the book of Revelation, they appear, the angel appeared to John. John wanted to worship the angel. The angel said to him, see that you don't do that. Only worship God. I'm your fellow servant and that of your, 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 your brethren. Only worship God. Any angel that demands to worship is of the devil. Any pastor that now demands to worship and uh, wants people to prostrate before him, already the devil has corrupted the heart. Paul also, he refused uh, to be worshipped. Uh, in the book of Acts chapter 14, verse 8 to verse 18, they went, uh, they healed that crippled man with Barnabas and people came out of Lystra. They came from the temple of uh, Zeus and they wanted to burn offerings to them. They said, no, you should not do that. Turn away from those, uh, uh, those uh, worthless uh, things. We are preaching that you will turn away from those who are idol worship. No, to serve now the living God. And people wanted now to beat them. They, all, they beat them up. They left uh, Paul almost dead. But he refused to worship. So worship only belongs to God. And we should not accept any worship from any man in the name of Jesus. It is uh, God that performs the miracle. Like uh, Paul, uh, Peter explained it uh, to the, the congregation, the book of Acts chapter three, why do you look so intently at us? Why do you marvel as if it were by our own holiness? Were they living holy? Yes. As though it was by our own power. Did God just give them power? Yes. Our own godliness. Were they living the godly? Yes. No. But they ascribe all the glory to God. In Acts chapter 3, verse 12. So that's also what we need to do. Ascribe all the glory. The name of Jesus. Through faith in Jesus made this man strong. He was made perfectly whole. Acts chapter 3, verse 16. So though Peter and John gave the credit to, to Jesus, but they were co-laborers with Jesus. But we need to learn to ascribe all the glory to God. He will not share his glory with any man. The reason why God is limiting his power because we want to take the glory. We want to be the, the man of my, uh, the, the, the man of uh, miracle and the power. 
And whenever the enemy starts, it's not just if it's even the brethren that are doing that, we would end up badly. And that's also how A. Allen ended up badly because the way they were promoting it, the man of the hour, the man of power, the beast, all the, we are not salesmen. Where we are propping the person, hyping the thing. It is Christ, the man of power. It is Christ, the Holy One of Israel. It is, it should be centered on Christ. And then pride will enter into your heart. And then very soon you are going to fall into sin. And you fell into sin. The devil got him. Pride goes before the fall. And he went back into drunkenness and he died drunk. The same thing also that happened with uh, William Branham. He said, you say, no, you are the only prophet being used. You are, no, you are not the only prophet. Go say to Elijah, why are you thinking that way? There are 7,000 other people that have not bowed. You're not the only one. The fact that I'm using you, that means that you are the only one. So that's the plan of the enemy to think that you are so unique, you are holier than anyone else. No. Change your way of thinking. William Branham did not want to change. And then they said, in the beginning, he was resisting. And they said, no, no, you are the Elijah, the restorer. Are we the same thing that happened also to Alexander Dowie? People can flatter you. You need to kill every kind of flattery. I have zero tolerance for flattery because I know exactly what it does. It is the weapon of the enemy. The fl flattery will set a snare under your feet. You feel good. They try to flatter Jesus before they tricked him. But he, you, the, the, they thought to call you are a good teacher. Said no one is good except God. Was Jesus good? Yes. But he refused that flat. He knew that one was flattery. So it happened to Alexander David. It happened to to, uh, to William Branham. They all fell through the flattery, the hypes of the people. You are the only one. God doesn't use anyone else. When God was using the Maria Woodworth Heather in the other side of the US, he was not the only one. And then, no, you are the mighty man of God. Yes. But it is God that is working in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. Ascribe all the glory to your maker. Lucifer was so beautiful, but he refused to ascribe the glory to God. He said, no, myself, I'm going to ascend, exalt myself. Well, you are a fool. And he comes and tricks us again and again and again and again. Power is like a serpent. It bites. That's what God said to Moses, take it by the tail. Uh, because I'm telling you the same power can bite you and you can yourself miss the promised land. And Moses missed the promised land himself. The same power bite him. And then when we go, when uh, William Brown started to think that he's now Elijah, the rest of have we all come the spirit of Elijah? Yes, we are coming in the spirit of Elijah to announce the second coming of Jesus. John Baptist came to announce the first coming of Jesus. We are announcing the second coming of Jesus. In that respect, we have all come in the spirit of Elijah. Are we Elijah? No, there's only one Elijah. There's no reincarnation here. And he started believing all kinds of nonsense. They went into his head until he started to preach all kinds of rubbish. And then what God will do, he will send a lying spirit to rubbish you so that... Uh, people would forget about you because you now want to take the glory. We need to give all the, that's what we will see in the application of perfect redemption plan, giving all the glory. If we don't fix this thing, we are going to limit what God can do. Because even the shadow of Peter now was uh, healing the sick. So imagine that even your shadow is healing the sick. That's what is happening to one of the healing uh, ministry at the moment. They started to think about all kinds of things. Now they are speaking all kinds of rubbish. Because God is not disgracing them. But I pray that they will listen, they will repent, they will be humble enough and describe the glory to God so that uh, the deceiving spirit that uh, has been released from the Lord to rubbish them, God will remove it in his mercy. And they will start speaking again sound things in the name of Jesus. God will not share his glory with anyone. So learn to ascribe the glory to God. When we listen to what Jesus did, Jesus always ascribed the glory to his father. 
that's what he did. Uh, even in, uh, he taught them to do so in John chapter 7, verse 18, he says, uh, he says, so, he who seeks uh, his blood, his, uh, he who seeks the glory of him who sent him, the same is true, and uh, no unrighteousness is in him. So we are seeking the glory of Jesus who sent us. And Jesus himself ascribed the glory. My father is working. And my, it is my father that is working, and I'm also working. We are co laborers with Jesus, just like he was co laborer with his father. If you do not understand that, as the father, uh, as the living father sent me, I live by the father, even the life he attributed to the father. So he eats uh, me and feeds on me even he shall live by me. So just like he lived by the Father, John chapter 6, verse 57, just like he lived by the Father, we also, as we feed by him, we are going to live by him. So he ascribed everything to the Father. We need to ascribe everything to Jesus. Jesus is the star that we are preaching. So learn to ascribe everything, the glory, the power, the righteousness. They have been imputed unto us. It is not ours to impute this to credit. It is not your money. That's what credit is. It is not your money. But you need to pay it uh, uh, back. We have a debt. That's what Paul talks about, a debt to pay. So let us learn to do the right thing in the mighty name of uh, Jesus. Always, whatever you do, always uh, ascribe uh, everything uh, to the Father. It is him, according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul is telling that, that he's working in us both to will and to do for my good pleasure. In the book of John chapter 15, Jesus tells us that without me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. So let us believe it and act accordingly in the name of Jesus. Uh, Now, holiness is the master key. Really, if we don't implement holiness in our life and in the church again, the church will die. Because when holiness is out of the window, the glory of God also is out of the window. When the sons of uh, Eli had to live in sin, the glory left the Shiloh. It became Ichabod. The glory has departed, inglorious. The problem in the church, any church where the, the sins, the sin is now dominant. The power also has gone. They've become just a byword. God, they are they have a name that they have a church, but actually they are just a synagogue of Satan now, like in the book of Revelation. God has checked out, the spirit has checked out of that church. Sanctification is the master key. It is a foundational for our walk with Christ. Without a holiness, none of us will be able to see the Lord. It is impossible. So in our walk with Christ, we should be holy without blame before God in love. That's what Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says. God wants to purify his church. And that's the role of the, the fivefold minister, uh, ministries, to present uh, a glorious church, the efficient church. That's what God wants, a, an efficient church to be presented uh, to him, a church that is working in uh, holiness. So let us, uh, there are some sins uh, that should not even be mentioned in the church anymore. Since we true, if we are truly born again, there are some sins that should not be mentioned anymore. All the sin linked to death that I've listed that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, 9 to 10, Paul uh, uh, listed everything for us. And then also he buttressed the thing in the 1 Corinthians chapter 10. John also in 1 John uh, re-insist again. In Hebrews chapter 10 also, Paul insists again, if we willfully practice sin, then there is no more sacrifice for sin. You can say, God, uh, forgive me. No. You deliberately did. That's what uh, led to God may forgive you, but He will. Uh, uh, your you for you will forfeit your inheritance. 
that what uh, Solomon did. Solomon willfully and defiantly, according to the Amplified Version, multiplied women, uh, did idolatry, he defiantly did it. So there was no more sacrifice that he could offer. God said, it is only not for you anymore. It is only for the sake of your father, David. But the moment you die, I'm going to take away uh, 10 tribes. You need to, there is no need of prayer. You have uh, forfeited that destiny, that glorious destiny, your inheritance. You have uh, squandered it spiritually and physically. So when now is the son who took over like we saw last time on Sunday, Rehoboam took over. It was also the Lord that put that lying spirit in the mouth of the young man to give him the wrong counsel because God has determined to scatter that kingdom because of what Solomon did. So sin has consequences. That's what Paul said in Galatians chapter 6. You are born again. You think that you will sin defiantly and that you'll be under the blood. No, don't be deceived. Whatever man sows, he's going to rape it. You're not going to escape. You're going to rape it. You're going to forfeit your own destiny. Your inheritance as well is going to be taken away from you, both the spiritual and the physical. I hope that you are not even going to lose your own salvation as well. He repented at the end of his life, but God said, I'm not changing my mind. So when his son came, God took 10 tribes away. He gave it to Jeroboam. And then he wanted to go and do war and God sent the prophet. Go and read it again, the chapter that I gave you on Sunday. And God sent the prophet. He said, this thing is of the Lord. This is why you should not be fighting. It was because of your father, Solomon, that God decided. It was a decreed already in the days of your father. So this thing of taking away 10 tribes from is from the Lord. And Israel went back to his tent. Nobody wants to fight because it is God that took it away. When we defiantly sin against the Lord, after we've, like Paul said in that Hebrew chapter, after we've received the knowledge, imagine those that were under the under Moses with the blood of bulls and goats, but the testimony of two and of three witnesses, every word were established and they were judged. Now, how much more we that have received the blood of Jesus by sinning deliberately, what we are doing, we are insulting the spirit of grace. We are trampling the blood of Jesus on the foot. There is no more sacrifice for sin for us, but the fearful expectation of a judgment. So you take it from uh, Hebrews chapter 10, from 22 to the end. And that's what Paul was teaching the church. There are some things that should not even be mentioned anymore in the church, but may God give us understanding in the name of Jesus. So uh, we want to perfect the saints. That's truly we want many meaning to perfect the saints is to make them like Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. That's the purpose of the sanctification, so that they will be conformed to the image of Christ. All of us. It is a work in progress. And that's what Jesus taught us. That's what Paul is teaching in the book of Ephesians. And even Noah in his days, he had this testimony that he was a perfect. For his generation, he was, that's why he was a saved. He didn't just profess that I'm a righteous and lived anyhow. No. He, he had this testimony that he was a perfect. That was in Genesis chapter uh, 6. That's what uh, no God said about Noah chapter 9, uh, chapter 6, verse 9. In his generation, he was a just man and a perfect in his, uh, man in his generation. So even when the world is, uh, people always say, no, you know, this generation, our children, uh, they are facing uh, so many things. God had to destroy that abominable uh, generation, yet he could find the family, a man and his children and his daughter-in-law. That was what I was teaching to my family yesterday. None of us are going to marry a pagan. Because no one made sure that his daughter-in-law were saved. So that when we are all going to be in the same destination, heaven, 
they're all going to serve the Lord. And it is dear to God that we marry Christians that are truly saved. So we want to perfect the saints. So Paul says that uh, brethren, I count myself, I count myself in not having apprehended or arrived. I've not arrived yet, okay? But one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind. So I'm forgetting my mistakes of yesterday, my shortcomings of yesterday. I'm a work in progress, but I'm not staying here today the way I was yesterday. There needs to be a progress. I'm forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forward. I'm not reaching backward, going back to my family. I'm reaching forward. There should be a better version of me. That's sanctification. It is an it is a, uh, instant thing, and it is an ongoing thing as well. So I'm reaching forward onto those things which uh, are before me. I press towards the mark. There's already a mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. There's a higher calling. There's a mark that we need to reach. And I pray all of us will keep on pressing. We will keep on pressing in the mighty name of Jesus. We've already talked of Jonah, uh, of Noah. He was perfect in his own generation. So we need to walk with God like Enoch as well. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. That's why I, I, I was saying, if, if Christ is enthroned the king in our heart, then we would do what he says to us, not do what we what is right in our own eyes. Those people, they enthroned Jesus king in the life, in the heart. The only potentate, the sovereign Lord, king of kings and Lord of lords, they enthroned him, king of righteousness in the heart. So they did what the Lord told them to do. Jonah did his own thing. He paid his own fare and went his own direction. So God followed him. So that's what it means. God is with you. God followed him. But as for uh, what no one decided to obey and uh, go to, to, to Nineveh, then God was going before him and he was following the God. So whenever we are full obeying God, actually we are walking with God. Whenever we are doing our own thing, but God is still obliged to go with us because he says he will never leave us and never forsake us. So it is God that is walking with us, but let us walk with God. Let him be the one leading and we the one following in the mighty name of Jesus. So that he'll be the one directing our steps according to his word. So I've explained already the atonement in the opening. So all this I've explained that uh, I've explained uh, that the, the atonement already in the beginning. That's what I wanted to, to skip this thing. Now, we want our righteousness or our holiness to exceed that of the Pharisees. Meaning it is not just an outward righteousness or outward holiness, but it is now even inside that we are made righteous. That God has dealt with even with all those cravings. The Pharisees, uh, credit to them, they had an outward uh, uh, holiness. So outwardly, in that Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 to verse 28, Jesus testified of them, though they were hypocrites, but outwardly they were clean. So they were not into any of the sin leading to death. But inwardly, they were still struggling with many things. Covetousness was in them. Uh, malice was in them. Uh, lust was in them. So God wants not just to wash the outside. He also wants to wash the inside because he has dealt with our sinful nature. The way now we even clean the inside, which is by the washing of the water, just like you are now washing the field. Now, just like when you have a house, you've removed everything, then it is, it is dirty, there's dust everywhere, then you take a hoover. If you have a tile, you take a mop and some water, then you start mopping the floor. So 
They always kill some dirt in us. This is not the washing of the water of the word of God that will do the cleansing. They have the insight. God has removed the heart of stone and given us a heart of flesh. God has removed that sinful nature. Now we, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now we don't want to tame the old man. We want him to die daily. And many times he will try to rise again. We keep on crucifying him, crucifying him, crucifying him. And the more you say no to your old nature, the weaker he becomes. That's why we confess the scriptures. This is who I am now. We remind ourselves. David was speaking to himself most of the time. He's speaking to his soul, my soul, my soul, meaning my intellect and my emotions. This is who I am now. God is no longer treating me according to all my iniquities. As far as the east from the west, God has scattered my iniquities from me. He has created in me a clean heart and renewed a right spirit within me. The spirit of a hallowed trend of murder is no longer in me. He confessed the scriptures. He spoke to himself. You need to know the power of confession and uh, do it. Take a subject where your mind is not renewed and address it. Crucify the flesh daily. And Paul, that's what he did. He died daily. He did not tame the old man. He buried it with Christ Jesus. And that's what we want to do. We want to clean the inside. Because there's an advantage when your inside is clean, when you have a clean hands, like Job was telling us, for the righteous also shall hold uh, on, my, on, on his ways, and he, uh, he who has a clean or pure hands shall be stronger and stronger. That's what Job chapter uh, 17 verse 9, uh, 9 says. When you are walking in holiness, when you've cleaned both the outside and the inside, your prayer life is going to be stronger. That's why the enemy, even after we have stopped sinning outwardly like the Pharisees, is still fighting us with the inside in the secret place. That's why confession is very good. That's why you see me confessing all the time my past sins, my present sin, whenever God rebukes me because it puts the devil to shame. And he runs away. When, before he starts something, I've already confessed it. When I see him planning something, I come and I share the testimony of what I used to be. And then I say, oh, this guy, you would expose me again. He hates being exposed. Whatsoever, the, 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 this is the strategy of Jesus. It is so simple. Whatsoever is said in the secret, shout it on the rooftop. If you cannot shout it on the rooftop and be okay with it, then you know you are not supposed to do that. But even if someone, uh, uh, like even when I was in Manchester, people would say, ah, don't, don't play with Brother Jerry because he would just come and say everything in front of the whole church. The people now knew my standard. So they were now very careful what they would say, how they would behave, because I will come and expose all that nonsense. I have a zero tolerance for nonsense because the enemy is using that to, like God said, to, to Cain. He's putting his foot on, uh, between, you, you want to close the door of sin, but the enemy is putting his foot between uh, the, 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 the door to prop it so that he wouldn't let her enter fully. So I want to close it once and for all. Every time I expose him, I keep on exposing him, exposing the work of darkness, have no fellowship forces with the unfruitful work of darkness, but rather expose it like I explained to you in the power of confession. If you are ashamed of confessing, then the enemy would be dealing with you in the private and messing your life. The prayer life is not going to be strong. But if you open your mouth, he that uh, conceals a sin, the Bible says he will not prosper. But he that confesses it and forsakes it, he will prosper. There are ways. And even uh, now, God, God says, uh, for the book of Job as well, from 22 to 28, he says, uh, uh, he will be in uh, the, 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 the one that has king, he will be in the position that uh, when he would decree a thing, that thing is going to be established unto him. And he will be also even to deliver the one who is not innocent because of the purity of his uh, hand. 
That's why when we come to church, if the pastor himself is in sin, my sister, my brother, you are on your own, basically. You are on your own because he cannot intercede for you. So you that want to intercede for your family, there are some requirements. You need to have a pure heart and clean hands. The inside and the outside of the cup must be clean. Otherwise, your intercession is weak. And the church is being defeated because of a lack of uh, holiness. And you can pray, 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 pray. And you'll be questioning why is God using this person more than uh, the other one? I know more of the scripture. But well, you are, you are like a Pharisee. You know more of the scriptures, but your life is not uh, pleasing unto the Lord. Or my life is not pleasing unto the Lord. And you want to fast. I would fast for 40 days and sit down. Clean your life, first of all. God is not after your fast. That's the first thing, holiness unto the Lord. When God appeared to Moses, the first thing he said to him, holiness, remove your sandals while you are standing to the holy ground. Holiness. We want to see God in our life. And without holiness, none of us will see him. Uh, so you can decide to tame your, 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 the old man, but we want to crucify him, not to tame him. So you can put uh, join Alcoholic Anonymous, Narcotic Anonymous. You can put some programs on your, on your, CD, on your CV, uh, on your website. You can put your, to block your, your thing, to be accountable to someone. This is all that is taming the old man. You are not crucifying him. You need to lock yourself away, pray and fast. God to deal with these sexual things. Once and for all, deal with this drinking, which we are no longer doing in the church. So when it comes, for instance, to sexual things, some people, in the beginning, I used to do that. Some people say, but I want to be accountable. Okay. I want to be accountable. So you, they would uh, put some software in the computers and so on and so forth. And they will send me the password so that if they go back to the pornographic thing, they would receive an alert on my email address. Okay. I will do that once, twice. I keep on receiving address uh, alerts, alerts. I, it means that uh, you don't understand what you want. You are just trying to tame the old man. And the fact that you're having accountability simply means that uh, it is just to, to appease your conscience that I'm doing the right thing, but you've not made really the decision to stop it. So when I see that the proportion after the first, the second, and third admonition, just stop it. So when I see that, because if I keep on seeing those alerts, alerts, it keeps on breaking my heart, breaking my heart, breaking my heart, and I'm not the one who is supposed to monitor to, you are not doing that onto, the, onto Brother Jerry, you are doing that onto the Lord. Imagine we have a 300,000 families when we will have them. You think that I would have the email account of everybody that is putting the uh, software on the phone uh, so, to, so, so that they will not be or mobile phone so that they will not be watching pornography. I can't do that. So what if now Brother Jerry is no longer here? So you would continue to do that. But like I was saying to my, my family, our pastor taught us the word of God. He taught us how to do it and he left. He would come sometime uh, every six months, or you would disappear for two years, you would go to another country, then you would come against the revival for six months, you would go. We did not serve because our pastor was uh, physically present. Now he has gone to glory. We are continuing to serve the Lord. The, you see, that's the quality of the product that he has. Out of the three of us, the two of us are now pastors. He truly did the discipleship. So even when he's not around, we are continuing to preach the gospel. We are going from glory to glory. We don't need him. So if I still need to call it, to check your, your, your internet, I still need to, 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 to have an app. Maybe you've gone to a pub. Maybe you've gone to a nine club. I don't have time for that. You need to lock yourself like Wigglesworth did for his anger management, like Paul did, he locked himself for three days and three nights, he did not eat anything, he prayed, God, remove religion from my life. So that's what we used to do when we were Catholic. We would come every Wednesday, we would confess. As soon as we come out, we continue to do the same, so that's religion. 
deal with the thing once and for all, sanctification. And let the outside and the inside be clean in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank God you stop the outside. Now you need to deal with the inside because that sinful nature has been taken away from you. So don't look for any excuse why we should continue. So should we continue in, again in sins of the grace may abound? God forbid, Romans chapter 6. And you are going to be weak. Let me tell you, sometimes the pastor is sleeping. And I know many pastors, like I was talking with another person, the church is fasting, they are eating. But if you think that the pastor was fasting, after the sin, a lot of hypocrisy. That's why I'm telling you the truth. Take your, your spiritual walk serious. It is your own life. You are going to deliver your own children and so on and so forth. You are going to intercede for your own family. But for your, that intercession to be strong, you need to have a clean hands, the outward and the clean heart, the inward. So true sanctification, that righteousness or sanctification must exceed that of the Pharisee, not just an outward one. <clears throat> So like I said, what is lacking in the church is real sanctification. So sin should no longer reign in our mortal body. Uh, like I said again, that Romans chapter 6, Paul will insist, insist. So if we abide in, in me and my word abide in you, then you shall ask whatever you desire. We say those things, but we don't know the condition attached. You need to abide with uh, uh, in Christ Jesus. Abide in him, abide in his love, abide in his commandments. That uh, John chapter 15. And then you will see whatever you ask, you are going to be able to receive it. People just want to ask, I'm going to receive it. No, there are conditions. Have you read the conditions? You need to abide in him. In the mighty name of uh, Jesus. So as you read the Bible, you read the my weekly milk and all the Sunday uh, services, the Wednesday Bible studies, uh, effortlessly, you are going to discover the ways of God. Because many times his ways are not our ways. His faults are not our faults. Thus, uh, the moment we are born again, the job is not to reveal the ways of God. Because if you don't know the ways of God, you don't know what is pleasing to him. You would think, many Christians, they don't know. They think if I press this button, I press this button. My brother used to follow another pastor teachings and so on and so forth. There are two apostles uh, until God said to him to read the weekly mail. Because he was having knowledge, but random knowledge. It was not a constructive knowledge. It was not like a curriculum. Once I used to read the weekly mail, it uprooted a lot of thoughts that he had that were ideas of men and only pointing to the written word of God. But also what it did is it uh, filled the gaps in the knowledge that he was lacking. Because many Christians, what they, uh, they are lacking is the knowledge of God. There will be a famine in the land, but not the famine of bread, but actually the famine of hearing the, the, the word of God and the thirst of, uh, of uh, the word of God as well. The knowledge, my people are perished for lack of knowledge. And uh, they are looking for formulas or maybe if I plead the blood of Jesus, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, then uh, the blood will work, they will have the miracle. Or fire, 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 and fire will work, or they will have the miracle. They would uh, give a seed of money and they will have the miracle. So they don't know. Now, when they would have another problem, they will try again uh, the blood of Jesus. This time it does not work. They will try the, the fire of the Holy Ghost. It does not work. They will try now the seed. It does not work. It's okay. I've tried this, I've tried this, but it, I did not have the same outcome. But they don't know why the seed worked when they did the seed. Why the, uh, the blood of Jesus worked when they did the blood of Jesus. Why the fire worked when they did the, the fire. Why, why when they commanded the thing left, they did not know the ways of God. Now, our job is to sit down and say to them, you know what? And that's what Jesus came to do. We never saw God before. The prophet tried the best, hallelujah, to depict God, who he was, his nature, but they, they did a poor job, a really poor job. So in the fullness of time, Christ came to explain to us the true nature of God. 
this is his nature, this is not his nature, this was a mistake, that was Elijah himself doing that, that was not God, he had a loaded gun, he misused it, but me, I'm not like that, my father is not like that. So he had to clarify many things to, re to reveal the ways of God. That's what he did with Moses, he made his ways known unto Moses. But the people or the sons of Israel, they only saw the act, the miracle. If you don't know the ways, you can't reproduce it. Someone can give you flour, uh, oil, and uh, yeast, and they say, to, okay, these are the ingredients for chapati. Okay, but can you make a chapati? I can't, because I don't know the process, how to mix them, and so on and so forth. But if I see someone doing that, I see the order of things, how they are kneading the dough, how they are making the different layers. I say, ah, okay, now next time I can read with the same ingredient, I have a flour, uh, oil, and uh, some yeast, how I can reproduce and make out of the chapati. I may have the ingredients, but I don't know how to mix them. I will not have the same result. So our job is to reveal the ways of the Lord so that we are no longer guessing what is truly important in the heart of God is holiness. Forget about uh, fasting. Before fasting, there is holiness. Forget about uh, giving. Before giving, there is the holiness. The person of Cain was rejected. His offering also was rejected. And if we don't uh, tell the people the ways of God, they will not be frustrated. I tried the tithing thing, it did not work well. Was your life in order with God? God was not after your money, it was not after your soul. I tried that the seed offering, I gave my car away. Did God tell you to give your car away? That's what God, was, Paul Peter was saying to Ananias. Who told you to sell your land? The land was yours? Did Barnabas sell his land? Yes. Did he give everything? Yes. But did God tell you to say God was after your life, your soul? Iniquity has been found in you, Ananias and Sapphira. You're trying to deceive people. Your soul is more important to God. Holiness is more important to God than you selling your land. God would raise other people to sell the land and bring the money like Ananias, like Barnabas. But you, is after your soul, first of all. And many times we are after the money of the people, first of all, before telling them to change. So God is beseeching each one of us to renew our mind. Isaiah chapter 55, uh, verse 8 to 11 says, to us that as the heavens are higher than the, than the earth, so are his uh, thoughts uh, higher than our thoughts, his ways are uh, higher than our ways. And we need to, that's why we study the word of God, so that we will discover what are the ways of God? What are the thoughts of God? Not my own thought, not my own opinion. What is he thinking about this situation? What is he thinking about marriage? What is he thinking? How does he see fornication? How does he see divorce? Not what the society says. Uh, in my group on Tuesday, I said to a sister that the fornicator are going to hell. She said, no, today nobody gets married. I say, that I don't care if nobody gets married to the fornicators are going to hell. And that's not what me saying. But they are going to, to, to church, they, are, they, they believe God as a, as it does not matter if they go to church. Paul said they are deceiving themselves and John said they are deceived as well. It's not Brother Jerry, these are the people that walked with Jesus and from the mouth of Jesus himself as well. I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You are goats, you are not sheep. So I said to her, go get married. People are no, we are no longer concerned about the eternal destiny of the people. What graves God is no longer graving us. But you just, just God forget about it, just let, let your power move. God say, no, I'm not a thing, I'm a person and I have thoughts, I have ways. These are my thoughts. You see how I want things done in my house. It is my house. I say, I will build my house. The church is my house. And this is the kind of bride I want. We say to Paul, the chaste bride without sport, uh, sports wrinkle. This is the one I want to prepare that for me. And when Paul was not getting the right result, he was afraid that he was be, going to be disqualified. He said, I'm afraid I've, I've done my best. Now you are being bewitched by other people telling you all kinds of things. You started well. 
So God will never change. Malachi 3, uh, 6, he said, I'm the Lord that do not change. So if someone needs to change, hallelujah, it is Brother Jerry. And as the heavens are higher than the earth, so his ways higher than our ways. Heaven and earth will even pass of his word from generation to generation will by no means pass away forever. His word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse 89. It is settled. We need to settle that in our heart as well and go do the right thing. In the mighty name of Jesus. So, uh, the last thing is we need to see Jesus. So, when we see Jesus, we are going to die to self. Not that we are going to see him physically per se, but as we read our Bible, we are going to see him in the word of God how he behaves, how he thinks, what are his ways. We discover his ways. We get to know him, first of all, through the word of God. And anyone that has seen God, he dies to his own ways. When God said that uh, whosoever sees me will not live, will die, yes, truly, he dies to self. And that's what we want, that everyone will die to self. And we would all see Jesus. When in uh, Exodus chapter 19, when uh, uh, God decided to appear to the whole congregation, they had to sanctify themselves for three days. You want to see God, you want God to be in your presence, in your house, there needs to be holiness. We need to walk on the highway of holiness as Isaiah chapter, uh, Isaiah 30, uh, 8 verse 5 says. There's a highway of holiness, and we need to walk in that highway of holiness. So when God decided to reveal himself to a whole congregation, Exodus chapter 19, he asked them to sanctify themselves so that he can come in the midst. And if you want God in our life, in our home, not just in church, you can come to church and God is in church because the pastor and the team are doing the things that God commanded so that the glory of the Lord would be in the house. Then you leave church, you come back to your home, and your home is in chaos. There's always strife, contention. I tell you where the Holy Spirit is, there is a peace. Before the Holy Spirit, before we were born again, we were always fighting with my brothers. We were always, uh, my mom was always an angry woman, very angry woman. But when we be received the Christ, there was a peace in our home. Peace in our home peace. I could not wait to come home after school, run back home. My mom could not wait after work to come home. My dad could not work after home to, after work to come home. There was a peace. The Prince of Peace was enthroned. The glory of the Lord was there. So if you want Jesus also to be in your house, sanctification. This is not just for Moses, for the whole congregation now as well. It's not just for the pastor. For the whole congregation now as well, because you are a priest and you are a king. You are a, a priestess and you are a queen. It is for everyone. So we, as we study the word of God, as we spend time in prayer, God is going to renew our strength. And we are going to rise up with wings as eagle. He's going to take away our weaknesses. All those works of the flesh that Galatians chapter 5 says he's going to remove them. Bring them. That's why you examine yourself. You should sit down and say, God, I'm given to anger. You need to deal with me in that aspect. So I sit down. I decide to fast. God, deal with this anger. I find the scripture that addresses anger. And then when I come out of that, that period, that's it. And the thing is dealt with once and for all in the name of Jesus. And I look at another work of the flesh. Oh, this drunkenness needs to stop. So I just uh, seek the face of the Lord. I wait upon the Lord. He takes my weakness and gives me his strength. That's what Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to verse 31 says. That's why we wait upon the Lord in prayer, in fasting. And every day, if you have that habit, before you leave your house, you pray through. 
you wait upon the Lord, then you will see there will be less power. They will, even if there will, there will be the same challenge at work, the same challenge at home, but the way you are going to act is different. You are not going to react, you are going to act because you know the counsel of the Lord, the peace of the Lord will be already guarding your heart. You are going to walk in love with the people. The joy of the Lord is going to be your strength. So that's what uh, the Lord uh, wants to do for you, for me, for every one of us uh, in the mighty name of uh, Jesus. So we are going to stop there. Uh, next time we are going to start with the righteousness uh, of uh, the law versus the righteousness of uh, faith. Now, do we have... Uh, Questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me pick on some people. Pastor Rosemary, do you have a question? No, thank you. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> okay, Sister Lydia, do you have any questions? No, thank you, but that um, explanation on the chairs is really good. Thank you. Okay, okay. Summarize a lot of things from the actual question. Okay. Papa Pierre, what is your question? You can say in French, I will try, uh, translate in English. What is your question? Mm. Le... La sanctification, comme tu as défini, c'est très bien. Très bien, trop même. Vraiment, c'est visible. Mais. La question se trouve maintenant. Quand tu avais défini ça, quand tu avais montré les deux chaises là, la première chaise qui est la dame de Eve, et puis d'autres, deuxième chaise, voilà, l'autre chaise là. Maintenant, tout est venu avec... Was, uh, the Adamic nature, and then this is a practicing sin. OK. OK. Maintenant, yeah. est venu Jésus-Christ de Nazareth. Il a levé toutes les deux chaises. Sont parties. Yeah. Bon. D'où vient maintenant, où se trouve les péchés de nos parents, les iniquités, les liens, de toutes sortes que nous, qui nous réclame maintenant quand il y a reçu Jésus-Christ comme Seigneur et Sauveur. Ok, now, so if these ones were taken away, both the Adamic nature and um, practicing sin, especially those three categories of the sin that into that were taken away, so where then is coming from uh, all those ancestral curses, uh, uh, the esprit familial. Familiar spirits and so on and so forth in the life of uh, believers. Okay, so that is the question. So you see, thank you for the question. And like I said, my people perish for lack of uh, knowledge. When you are born again, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are new and all things are of God. There's nothing anymore spiritually. I say it again, there's nothing anymore spiritually that ties you to your physical family. Now, everything in you are of God, like Paul says in Romans, you are a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. All, not some of them only, all things are new. And all things are of God. You are a new creation, not a new evolution. And uh, the way Paul also explains it, that you've been grafted. So you've been cut off from the tree of your family. You are a branch in your family tree. You've been cut off. And then you are, you that were a wild olive branch. That actually is in another perfect redemption plan, not in this one. But yeah, I'm just opening a big parenthesis. So, and then you've been grafted now into the 
olive, the cultivated olive tree. So your life is no longer coming from that other tree, not coming from Christ, but Jesus with the vine. The plan of the enemy that has always been working and is continuing to work in the life of even pastors is the same trick he pulled on Adam and Eve. But the journalist one was so simple. You mean that I've been cut off from my family tree spiritually? Whatever was working though is no longer supposed to be working in me. And then he says, has God really said? Then Eve says, um, I'm not too sure that I'm going to really die. And the devil said, no, you're not going to die indeed. But God said, you're going to really die. So the same thing as well, our new creation is being challenged by the devil. Has God really said that you are holy? Has God really said that he cut off the Ezekiel chapter 16? That he cut off the umbilical cord. Has God really said that you were cut off from that wild olive and you were grafted now in uh, the cultivated olive? Has God really said? Then uh, what will people will do? They will look at the circumstances. That's why Paul said the things that we see, they are temporal. And they are subject to change. But the things which we do not see, they are eternal. So you are just born again today. Devil says to you, no, 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 that, that's not true. You still have some spiritual ties that are linking you to that family. Okay. That's one of the reasons why we, as a prophetic action, we want to baptize the people. It's not just as a symbol. It's also a prophetic action they died to the family as well. They died to the world. They died to the family. They died to the ancestral curses. They died to everything that was uh, to the witchcraft in the family. They literally died. Do you believe it now? That's where many Christians don't believe. Oh no, the curse of that is now family is still working against me. And the worst thing that Christians have, they even believe that the curses that were in the Bible for the people that hated God are working against us. Colossians told us that Christ, Galatians chapter 3, sorry. Galatians chapter 3 from 10 to 15. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. What is written, curses everyone that hangs on the tree so that the blessings of Abraham may come unto the Gentiles. So on the behalf of God, also, in, uh, in behalf of God, there is no more curse that God is pronouncing on his children. The only curses that we have is when we, uh, it's our own, own doing, when we go outside of the boundaries of the gospel, the Bible says if you break the edge, the serpent will bite you. If you stay within the parameters of the Bible, you don't need to worry about uh, the snake at all. But if you break that uh, age, be guaranteed the serpent will bite. That's why we tell the Christian if you close those to three doors, that's why I only put the three colors, those three categories sexual immoralities, idolatry, and heresies. Basically, these are those three categories are all the sins that are listed in 1 Corinthians 6 9 to 10. If you close them, Go and sleep. No witch, no wizard can, uh, the curses in the family can reach you. The only window that you would open is the window of fear. That's why the devil comes and questions, has God really saved? It's, it's so simple, that kind of gospel. Has God really saved? And he will tell you of testimonies of so-and-so died, so-and-so died, and fear will grip your heart. And this uses that window of fear that you use in the life of uh, Job to enter now and strike. Because fear works like faith. 
Fear is that you're empowering the devil that what he's saying against you is going to happen. Faith is a, you're empowering God that what he said about you is going to happen. So whose report do you choose to believe? And that is truly the battle now. My job is to inform your mind. Your job is to believe what you've received here in your heart. Because with the heart, one believes. And with the mouth now, confession is made unto salvation and healing deliverance. Now, the camp of the enemy, they will continue to do their own attacks. They will continue to do their own attacks. So all the familiar spirits in your family, or the, it is as if someone that they used to collect, uh, like the mafia, they used to bully you and you are paying them money every month. You are paying them blood every 10 years. You will sacrifice someone, someone will die in your family. They had access whenever they wanted to your life and to do half work in your life. Now they don't have it. He's angry. Like Revelation chapter 12 says, when he was cast out, he said, what to the earth? Because Satan knows his time is limited. So he's angry. So he's afraid. That's why he's trying to kill, steal, and so, so they will be attacking you. And that's why some Christians that are weak, they deny the truth of the word of God. In the book of Isaiah chapter 50, uh, 54, God says, indeed, they are going to assemble. So God did not lie to us. The fact that he has delivered you doesn't mean that the enemy would fold up his hand. They will assemble. But it is not God who is sent them. It is on behalf of God you have uh, no attack. But God said, whosoever assembles against you, they are going to fall for your sake. Do you believe this? And no weapon that is fashioned against you is going to prosper. Do you believe this? And that's why he gave you an armor of God. We've already uh, explained that uh, on our Sunday service. We are going to see it also in the Prophet Redemption Plan um, 4, I think, Jehovah Shama. You have a shield of faith now to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. All of them, not some of them. Then the enemy will say, you see, Pastor so-and-so, he lost his son. Pastor so-and-so, the general overseer of so-and-so lost his son as well. So if the general overseer lost his son, his son died. So how can you protect your own son? I don't know what was happening in the secret. Like I said in Matthew chapter 17, the failure of the apostle does not change the will of God. I don't know what went wrong in the life of the man of God. I'm only seeing the outward. I'm not seeing the inward uh, dealings of God in the life of that man of God. But I know if I close the door that God told me to close. I know he promised that the serpent will not strike. And as long as they were obeying God, no serpent came and they bite them. The wall of fire was activated. But as long as they made the age in the fence, the serpent came in and started to bite them. So that's how simple the word of God is. So your family members, your the witches in your family, they would continue to do their own thing. Just like they've been doing their own thing before, but simply it's not going to work. Numbers chapter 20, for there's no enchantment, there's no fortune telling, there's no divination against Jacob. The Lord has blessed them and no one can revoke it. The more they curse you, the more God turns it into blessings. The more they curse you, the more God, including the Christian brethren that are cursing you, the more they curse you. If you're in the right standing with God, the more they curse you, the more God lifts you up. That's why sometimes I laugh. Many times I just laugh. I went to see someone, uh, a father of uh, someone, and the father was in the occult. And he was doing some things against uh, the children. But because the children now were under my wings, he could do nothing, nothing at all. That's what the Bible says that those who are that the church has, there are some things you cannot get outside of the church because the church is the church of Christ Jesus so you have a level of protection as a, 
uh, husband over your children, over your wife, first of all, covering over your wife and over your children. And as a couple, have a husband and a wife, you have a covering over your children. There's a level of covering in the same church. There's a level of covering in the church as well. That is a higher covering than the, the people that are um, not in the church. Because, because of the purity of the hand, like Job has explained, even the ones that are in the church that are still living in sin, they are protected because there is a shepherd is repelling all the, the family aspects that are coming from those families. Those, those people themselves have not closed the doors in their own personal life. But the church now is watching over the soul. Like Hebrews chapter 13 says, the church is watching over the soul. So that happened a long, long time ago. So I met the father, we ate and so on and so forth. Uh, we talked about everything. He said, no, I'm not of the devil, blah, blah, blah. And I knew he was of the devil. He knows, he knew that I know he was of the devil. So we ate, we laughed, and so on and so forth. When I came back home, like I said to you, I always say to you in the house of prayer for all nations, no matter what your, your relatives are or what they do, if they don't, uh, if they send something against you, it will go back on their own head in the name of Jesus. And the poor person died, and uh, we went and buried him because he did not want to let go of the children. And the children now are in Christ Jesus. They are under uh, Psalm 91, under the wings of the everlasting uh, God. So if he sends his things, God says, if you dig a pit for the, the righteous, you yourself are going to fall into that uh, pit. It is not Brother Jill. I said, God, is, there are some principles in the Bible here. That's what I say to some parents that are into occult and witchcraft. Leave your, your sons and your daughters who are Christian alone. Especially if you are in their house of prayer, leave them alone. But whatever you are to, going to try against you, you're going to boomerang. Full stop. It's going to boomerang. Fall up on your own head. So I did not have to pray anything against him. In fact, I don't have time to pray anything against him. So I just saw what he was doing, and I just counseled it. So when I counseled, so those spirit that he sent, they are still looking for someone. They will go back to himself, and they went back to himself. I went to eat again with another person some time ago. And that wonderful mother was the cause of many things in the lives of uh, it, uh, uh, children. But uh, the children were now under the wings of the, of the Lord, according to Psalm 91. And the children have closed the doors of uh, spiritual thing. And she could no longer have the control. So I saw her in the vision and uh, uh, I saw exactly what she was doing. So she invited me. I went in those days. I ate with her. So you know that the person in your car is even a witch, but you are eating because no, you will even eat deadly things. It will by no means hurt you at all. That's how secure I am in my God. I just wanted politely to say to her, leave her. Leave your, you are the children that are not under the house of prayer for all nations. You can, they, they can be your chicken, you can eat them and do whatever, do havoc in their lives and so on and so forth. But those who are under the house of prayer for all nations, you can't do anything about them anymore. They've escaped. They've found refuge in Christ Jesus. And I, as a shepherd, I'm watching over the soul. And that is the, that's why God left the church. He left some to the apostle, prophet, pastors, a teacher for the equipping of the saints. So the enemy would continue to attack. He would never stop, provided you close those doors. That's why I'm always uh, insisting close those doors. 
don't uh, venture outside the defense that the Lord has uh, set for us believers for our own safety. And then the rest, leave it, do your own little prayer, but the power of the church as well. One of us will chase a thousand, two of us will put 10,000 to, to flight. We have a lot of individualism that has come into the church. It has been, and it, it is out of selfishness, it has been imported from America and everybody also has a copy, but that's not uh, the way Jesus taught it. Even uh, in the prayer of the Lord, this is how you pray, our Father, not my Father. It's always a corporate prayer, our Father who art in heaven. Our Lord be thy, thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, not give me. When they are praying also, he's not just praying for himself, he's also praying for others. You need to learn to pray for others. The Lord prays, not my Father what in heaven, our Lord be our name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day, it is give us. So we need to learn to pray for the corporate uh, body, for our family, for our church, for our cell. So everyone is being covered at every single level. Everyone is being watched spiritually at every single level. In the mighty name of uh, Jesus. And that's what we do. That's the role. When the church is properly done, even when uh, the, 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 the sister Paulette, a mother, a mother wanted to go to glory a long time ago. From the time she was uh, 18, 85, she, uh, she has been a widow for 20 years. She wanted to go back to with the Lord because she had nothing to live uh, for now. But I wanted her, I loved her, I wanted her to remain uh, here. And I was watching over her soul. She had the first uh, stroke, I prayed, she came back to normal. She had the second stroke, I prayed, she came back to normal. She had the third stroke. So when I came, she refused even to receive me. I prayed, but she did not want to be healed. But I did not want to release her either. So she was in the hospital for five years. And uh, every time God would come and say to me, Jerry, let her go, she wants to come home. I say, I don't want her to come home yet. I remember I was at my mother's uh, house and I would be walking in the park to go to church. And I'll be praying, the Lord is talking to me, I want, she wants to come home. She doesn't want to be here. She wants to come home, Jerry. I want you to release her. As long as the Samuel that had uh, watched over the life of uh, King Saul was praying, God could not even remove uh, King Saul from the throne. And he had to say to, to Samuel, stop praying. It was only when Samuel died that uh, God could remove King Saul. For 38 good years, the prayer of uh, uh, Samuel kept Saul alive and on the throne, though God has rejected him from the second year. So I remember that day I was walking, and I was, I was even here. I went to pray and God said she wants to come home. So I called Sister Paulette and I was just joking. And uh, I said to Sister Paulette, Mama wants to go home. And uh, she, we discussed and then I prayed. And then the next day, she went to be with the Lord. We literally, when the church is properly done, we literally watch over the souls of the people. And sometimes I go to some people's house to send them a message that your daughter, your son is no longer under your covering. You can't do anything about your son and your daughter anymore. They are under my wings now. I'm watching over the souls. So put your weapon away. If you fire, I'm going to fire back. So Go and mess up with the other children, but not with the ones that are here. The familiar spirit that you used to operate in the life, if you send them again, they are going to go back against you. So send it against all the other children that are still living in sin, don't know who they are. 
but in here we are watching over the souls of the people so that is the advantage of the church that is the advantage of the church and we watch over one another because the enemy is always attacking but god is on our side and if all of us do our little little part we also pray for the pastor you need to pray for the pastor paul always said pray for us pray for us pray for us pray for us because what the enemy now is trying to do let me take away that pastor so that i can have access to the the, the, the sheep strike the shepherd and then the sheep will be scattered in the mighty name of jesus it won't happen so the family spirit will still operate but you are not under them anymore so if you are resist it is like if your your house is closed and uh, someone is knocking at your door you are not under any obligation to open that door again you say no you are no longer welcome in this house get out in jesus mighty name get out when my auntie was trying to reactivate those uh, spirits so that i will come into a coffin when the lord decided okay i'm going to deal with her so i called my she, she threw some two eggs no weapon that is fashioned against us will prosper and that is literal if you throw it that i will come into a coffin it is your own son that is going to go into a coffin full stop and i don't need to pray at all because i believe this book and in the morning i saw that spirit come into my house i called my mom i said okay uh they send something here but don't move don't leave the house don't leave the house don't today she threw two eggs two roosters eggs today you are going to see at 10 a daughter died at uh, 2 p.m. A second daughter died. She had two dead bodies in the coffin on the on the, in the comp compound in the same day. That's when she backed off because it was so costly on her. She buried them. So in the space of two years, three years, she's lost to three children, to her three children. And then my cousin took a gun and shot my mom because they could no longer deal in the spirit realm. They could not. Uh, they were defeated. They had to come physically with a weapon. So she, my cousin took the weapon and shot my mom. And the bullet ricocheted, did not catch my mom, and the, 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 the weight was scattered. But the Bible said, touch not my anointed. Do my prophet no harm. The touch is my, my touch is you touch is the apple of God's own eye. Well, my cousin, we buried him as well. So she lost her. Just by trying to attack us, she buried five children. She had, she gave birth to 12 children and she has lost the six. No, she has lost the seven out of the 12. And for just attacking uh, my mom and the us, she has lost the five. And she still, uh, so she would uh, stop doing that witchcraft for year two. For two years, yesterday I saw her trying to look for something again. I just called my mom. We just pray, God, just have mercy on her. Because the more she does it, there are principles in the Bible. When you're in right standing with God, just boomerangs. God turned that blessing, in, that curse into a blessing and put that retaliation on the head of those same people themselves. So you can sleep uh, at peace and not worry about those uh, familiar spirits in the name of Jesus. That's why I always keep on saying, keep your life clean. Keep your life clean in Jesus' mighty name. And then you will not have to worry about those familiar spirits. Even if your own mother is a witch, your own father is a wizard, your own mother is a... Uh, my father did not have to worry about my, my, my parents. My, my grandfather was a wizard. My grandmother was always uh, bringing witchcraft in our house. My dad was in the right standing with the Lord. He loved them. He fed them. Feed your parents. Feed. It is your responsibility. 
whatever they do it won't affect you provided you are in right standing with god then you will not fear in his uh, family aspect. The devil said, as God really said, do you think he's at the simple? The devil does not have a power. He has some power, but he's so little like that of a fly compared to our power that we have in the name of Jesus. Otherwise, I would be buried long time ago. So, have this confidence. A lot of preaching are magnifying witchcraft. A lot of preaching are making as if the power of God is equal to the power of the devil, or God is just slightly above the power of witchcraft. God said to Isaiah, to whom shall we you compare me with? Which of the gods of this earth can you try to put us on the same scale or compare us? Besides me, there is no other God. Even where Jesus says, he says in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2, you, we've crushed Jesus. You are seated in the heavenly places. Not just slightly above, not above, far above. What don't we understand? We are far above them. Even when I was five years old, my grandmother's friend that was a witch doctor she was afraid of me so i always see a bright star a bright star it's going to be a, a big uh, wizard in my family they don't believe i'm a christian they believe i'm a wizard I'm, they believe that i'm the one who collected all the witchcraft of the family because they tried to kill me but the hand of the lord was upon me again and again so you are far above, not slightly above, not above, far above. As the heavens are higher than the earth, there is no comparison with our God and those worthless donkey idols. The problem, we have been listening to teachings that have magnified the devil, that have barracked the devil, that has made it seem like the power of God is just... Uh, is even equal to that of the devil. Since even some of the African movies, the way it is depicted as if uh, the, the devil was more powerful than uh, the believers. And they will, you will see some of those uh, Nigerian movies, African movies, the witch doctor will curse the pastor and the pastor will become mad. The witch doctor will curse the believer and the believer will become mad. And these are films made by Christians. That's why I don't waste my time with them because it is not according to this book. This book is far above all the other books. Far, I've been shot, like I said to you twice, no bullet entered me. My mom has been shot, no bullet entered her. When they could not do it spiritually, they came with a literal guns and still no bullet could enter my mom. And they themselves died. And we buried them. And I send money for my contribution to bury them as well. When anyone threatened Idaosa, Idaosa, even including pastors that were jealous and had to threaten Idaosa, Idaosa will say to them, I will attend your funeral. They will, they will threaten you, we are going to kill you. You say, oh, I will attend your funeral. I don't need to pray about it. Your, when Pharaoh threatened Moses, I will never see you again. The day I see you, you are going to die. Moses said, you have spoken rightly. I'm never going to see you again, Pharaoh. The day we meet again, you are going to die. And the day they met again, Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea. So know who you are and be a true Christian. That's our problem. We are not true Christians. We are in church, but we are not true Christians. That's why we are defeated left and right. And that's why we are looking for olive oil. We are looking for handkerchief. Uh, everywhere we go, we have handkerchiefs. And before we pray at night, we put handkerchief on our head to pray because the handkerchief that the man of God has given unto me. Do God use, uh, does God use handkerchiefs? Yeah, does he use olive oil? Yes. But first of all, put your life in order. It is better than the handkerchief. It is better than the olive oil. When the doors are closed, 
The family spirit can be out knocking at the door. Nothing will happen. And many times I even fear for those, I feel for those parents. I, I just go see them, I say to them, just leave your children alone. Those that I can go and, and see. I will travel to England, I will travel to Wales, I will travel everywhere, I will take my train, go eat with the parents. I'm, I'm speaking in codes, they know what I'm saying, I know what they are saying, I say to them, your children, they are protected. So leave them alone for your own sake, so that you can live longer. Don't try them anymore. Don't try to bring them in bondage anymore. Because otherwise we are going to your funerals. God is, God is overly protective. He says, for the sake of Israel, I will kill Egypt. I will kill Kush. Kush is the Ethiopia. For the sake of my son. Don't touch my son. He says, it's like a mom, uh, mama bear. You don't need to harm the bear, the, the, the cob. You just need to touch it. The moment the bear will come, you will just smell your scent on uh, uh, her cob. She would track you down like uh, the prophet Zechariah said, and he would rip open your rib cage. Don't touch his children. God will literally kill you. So you are serving the God that is overly protective. And throughout Jeremiah, throughout Isaiah, God said to them, the only reason you were taken into captivity is because you decided to walk like the pagans. So that's why Samaria went into captivity. Now you, Judah, you did not learn that lesson. You want to walk like them, you also are going to captivity in Babylon. Now my people are only destroyed for lack of knowledge and because they reject the knowledge. Otherwise, no one can defeat them. If God be for us, who can be against us? The only person that can be against us is ourselves. We are the only one who can sabotage our future. The only one who can sabotage our destiny. The enemy will try. They cannot unless we open the doors or we open the window. Peter could tell us, if you add this thing to your faith, you add this thing to your faith, you add this thing to your faith, you are never going to fail. And God is so confident. Even the book of Isaiah was saying, there is no other God that can predict the future. Satan cannot predict the future. He can only tell you about your past. He does not know anything about your future. But me, I tell you your future, and it comes to pass exactly as I said it. There is no other God that can do it. God is so confident that no one can stop his plan. Every time his plans are delayed, it is the human element that delayed it. Moses that was disobedient, the people that were disobedient, Joseph, the, 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 sorry, the Jacob that was disobedient, he was 20 years. Every time it was always the human element, but God watched over his word to perform it. When he found someone that was in alignment with him, he performed it. If God be for us, who can be against us ourselves? Reuben himself that sabotage his destiny. Judah himself. Levi himself because of his anger. And so on. Solomon himself. Manasseh himself that sabotage his future. If you stick with the Lord, oh, no weapon fashion. That's why I can say to people, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to add. It is not just today. Even when I was in primary school, I understood it, that I was the only one who could sabotage my future. And I, I knew when I sabotaged it, <laughs> I knew uh, what the Lord told me to retrieve it. You are the only one. That's why we take responsibility of our Christianity. We stop blaming. See, God said, uh, Isaiah chapter 50, stop the pointing of the finger. Take responsibility. If you stop the pointing of the finger, blaming everybody else, then your light will never shine. The glory of the Lord will never be your real God. But if you stop the pointing of the finger, but you look inwardly, you examine yourself, what do I need to do? That's what Paul said when he was converted. Lord, who are you? That is his first question. Chapter 9 of Acts. And what will you have me do? Me. And God explained, this is what you're supposed to do. This, 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 and that. We have self-inflicted wounds in the kingdom of God. 
but I can guarantee you, don't worry about the witches in your family. Let me tell you the truth. Don't worry about the witches in your family. Like Elijah could say, as I live, and as the Lord God lives before whom I stand, don't worry about anything. Don't. The Lord God will watch over your soul. Hallelujah. You will arise and all your enemies will be scattered in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Abapia, was it abundantly clear? Amen. It's okay. Thank you. Is there any other question from anyone else before we close? Lynn and uh, Kelvin. No, we far thanks, Jerry. It was great. I love the sofas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that Galaxy S20, I don't know who is that Galaxy S20. Do you have a question? That's me. Uh, no, 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 thank you. Okay, <laughs> okay that's fine. Uh, Sister Harriet, do you have a question? No, thank you. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. The devil has magnified his power beyond uh, measure. And uh, many of us are bought into that lie that uh, his power was uh, even with your power. You say beside you, there is no other God, no other. Search the universe, search all the nations. None of the gods of this nation can be likened unto you. With whom will you liken me? No, no one. We serve a great God. All the gods of the Egyptians, just after the second miracles, they could no longer follow up with the monsters. And they themselves confessed to Pharaoh, let these people go. Don't you see how the whole nation is being destroyed? For the sake of your people, you will destroy your whole nation. You say, for your, my, your sake, Jacob, I destroyed Egypt and I destroyed Ethiopia. Because you are my son, even my firstborn. And just like Israel was your son, you say, let my people go. Or I will kill you. Full stop, that's let my people go or I will kill you, Pharaoh. This one is my son. Whosoever will dare say, who is, your, who is Yahweh? Who is God that I should obey him? Yeah, that's the wrong, the wrong statement to make. I pray that we will be bold, we will be confident, we will know who we are in Christ Jesus. And we will not go by hearsay. We will go by what your word says. This is the final say. Let God be true in his word and every man a lie. Whenever the enemy will come and lie to us, he can even fool some preachers, has God really said. It is not that simple. The gospel is so simple that many times we neglect it. We want to complicate it. It is so simple. But I pray my King and my Savior that you stretch forth your hand to heal and to deliver. I also pray for our own parents that are still in darkness, that don't know the love of God. I pray that they will repent in the name of Jesus. They will stop doing the wrong thing that will come and fall up on their own head in the name of Jesus. But you would have mercy on them. Mercy on them. You would acquit them even of the guilt of bloodshed. Hallelujah. Whom were not acquitted before. I pray that in their heart they will surrender to you that uh, they will realize that there is no power in those things anymore, but they will come to you and surrender and serve you. I pray for our brothers and our sisters that are still lost, that they will surrender to you as well, because you want them to leave and not die, to declare the works of your hands. You don't even delight in the death of the wicked. If they just leave your people alone, you say, Pharaoh, let my people go. I don't want to do anything. Let my people go. And Father, we pray that no weapon that the enemy is trying to fashion against us will prosper. And every tongue that dares arise against us in judgment, I condemn it. It is our inheritance as the sons and daughters of the Most High God. And our right standing is coming from you. We thank you because all the fiery darts of the enemy, we quench them all. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 
Thank you, thank you very much.